let's get back into the game. Come on, game. Show up on the thing. <laughs> there it is. Okay. I want to make sure I'm loading back into the one I was at. I, uh, got a couple of extra achievements after stream last time. So I, like, went back on a second save file and what did I do then? Oh, I clicked on the bug that was here at nighttime before a thousand times to get an achievement. And I went to the store page to get that achievement as well. Uh, okay. So the great Zaroff's magic show, I'd better not touch it. When the hair saw the ticket, he fell asleep. Audio always seems all over the place. Like, if the speech could be a little higher, that would be great. Right, so... We came back from the North Pole with our last spell. Glimmer of Hope. And the moths... The moth people... Oh, hi, Mats. No worries. Um, had a drawing request and had to finish it. Welcome. Uh, I'm just trying to go over what we what we accomplished at the end of last episode. So, yeah. We came home from the North Pole, got the spell, the Merv Hope. The moth people flew away, and the Marquis, acting all suspicious, disappeared and left this leaf. And, uh... So I went home, actually got to see my house, and I had been missing for several years, my mom wasn't there anymore, and I became very depressed, and I had to use the spell to get out of it, and came back to Mousewood to figure out what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. The magician, the old magician that lives in town, was trying to catch these suspicious lizard guys in human masks, uh, but got caught in a bottle himself, so I freed him. What? And uh, now we're trying to capture the lizards. Out one. I have to trick the other two into getting to opening the bottles. Yeah. Well, Mom wasn't there. But, uh... The, like, stone next to my house told me that she had left. Okay. So, I was very brain dead at the end of last episode, and I was having a lot of trouble trying to figure out this stuff. So, let's see if we have better luck. Sake seems to be here. And that'll help. Uh, I have to remember where they are. First, one of them's in the swamp area. One of them is... Where is that other one? Wait a second, I don't remember you being here. I thought you were somewhere else. Have you seen my purse? Uh, no. I want to exchange it for a ticket to see the great Zarbo. The Hedgehog Brothers have even got tickets. I just have to see him. But you waited so long for your purse. Never mind, you have no idea. You're boring. Go away. You know, I definitely had that conversation with her. I think it probably was here, but I just didn't remember. Mm -hmm. huh, huh, huh. Okay, so we found nobody. Let's go outside of the, the town. Okay, I definitely know where one of these is. This way. Okay. Oh. I thought I thought he disappeared. Oh, finally. Huh. I guess he's just sleeping, standing up. Okay, so this is one of the guys I have to get. 
Mm, I did figure out that he can be distracted. And that I can make this fly move around and he can... He can like... Oh, okay, we'll just see it. So he's distracted right now. Um, and now he's not distracted. Another way I could do it is by having him tell me my fortune. But I'm just not sure what I'm supposed to do to get him to take the bottle and open it. So I can interact with the drum when he's distracted, but not when he's not distracted. That's where the fortune balls come out. You will suffer bad luck if you touch that hatch. Uh, I just wanted to wipe off some dust. Teller of lies. Mm hmm. I don't know. Oh, sorry, Buzzy. Well, will you? <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> I don't have a lot of ideas, kid. No, I'll keep. <clears throat> oh, I remember where the third one is. It's uh, in the clock tower city hall thing I'm all here now all right uh, nope do this thing it's much faster to try this way rather than to I don't think um Oh, you had to walk over there to tell me that? Maybe you can try blocking the ball mechanism while he's distracted. Okay. Well, I couldn't block it with a sticker. Unless I was clicking on the wrong spot. Maybe with syrup? Well? Uh... That thing? I did get this beat in this area. Are you doing anything? Uh oh, did I break it? Uh okay, let's try it this way, I guess. That will be can I pay can give you a lucky oh, yeah? <laughs> day. What? Nothing oh, and I posted that art in Discord if you want to look later. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm skipping through this because we heard it a couple of times already last stream. Okay. He's going to keep himself busy for a while. Da -da -da. Oh. You will suffer bad luck if you touch that hatch. Hmm. Okay. The flower and beat. Okay, I was wondering if it had to be open for me to put it in, but I'm really sure that I did that like as fast as I could. Um, okay, I'm gonna exit out of the game and restart it. Because I think something is borking. Bork, bork. Okay, now I need to burb for a small thing. I'll be back in just a bit. We'll see about that. Um, it's unusual that nothing is happening. Like, he doesn't say, uh, no, or anything like that. 
<laughs> Hi, Spike. Welcome. Okay. I'm in an effort to not sit here forever, um, the hatch does have to be open. But... Apparently he's telling his own fortune for it. Hurrah! It's dance with joy. <laughs> oh yes. Dancing. You will what? You, you want a white ball, so he needs oh, to have a white ball, so he can't put it back. Maybe use the flower. Oh, use the flower first, right. Can you also tell your own fortune? Of course. <laughs> Hurrah! It is a white fortune ball. It's done. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Buzzy. Well, will you? Oh, no, it fits. Well, will you stop tight? Because <laughs> he definitely wouldn't notice that. <clears throat> it wasn't to be. Okay. Hmm. Oh good, he picked it up. Dance with joy, lucky one, for luck surely is with you today. <laughs> good luck. See you later. Luck. So. I'd better keep it. Okay, that's not it. That must be mm. I guess I've been using this sticker the whole time. Hey! <laughs> Perfect fit. Okay, you say so. No, give it to the guy. Good idea. Good idea. Good idea. Good idea. Uh, kid? Can you tell me my fortune too? That will be one. You can I pay? Me? I can't. Oh yeah. What? Nothing. The old. Uh oh. Popped out. Dark. Clouds gather above you. Might have known. Bad luck. Yeah, yeah. Luck is a. He's gonna keep him. You will. It is your fault. But you will not be able oh, to do sorry, anything buzzing. about it. Come here, you juicy little thing. Well, we. I'm done with this for now. <clears throat> I'm done with this. Okay, guess I can't pick it up. Okay, now we want him to get the white ball because it's Can you also tell your own got the sticker on it, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Hurrah! It is a white fortune ball. It says, take a jug for some good luck. Oh. How oh, oh. But the ball has never lied. <laughs> but where do I get a jug? This is kind of like a jug. Bottle, the ball leads me to it. Whew. 
I must open it to reach my fortune. Well then, go ahead. I give luck and see. Luck is given to me. Whoa. Sound effects are so loud. Finally. I couldn't have stood that for much longer. Yeah. Oh, hello. He's finally gone. Kitsuna. Kokage's Aiden are in this world. How can that be? You know them? They were already in my world. Whoever touches them will be lost forever. Do you really think so? What? I can no longer open the path to my home. That must be their fault. I want to go home. Me too. Kitsuna, wait. She's gone. Uh, were those the names of the lizards? Or somebody else? Okay, now for the clock tower one. Oh man, those crows calling just makes me think of summer. It's so cold out here. Hall, right? You have come because the pain is eating you up, like all the others. You want to see Zaroff, like all the others. But you are only a child, a human child. I can smell it. You own no securities, no property, nothing. Come back when you have a trade, something you can use to speculate with. I don't think he's taking me seriously, and he smells of alcohol. Okay, so because of what he said, I thought I had to bring something to him, but it looks like I have to use the spell, the cunning spell on this guy. To make him think that I have money or whatever room for financial maneuvering what does that smell like oh yes i am so rich trained plumbers make a pretty good living you know huh. you have come because the pain is eating you up like all the others absolutely you want to see zaroff like all the others exactly are you ready yes, to definitely. Absolutely. It allows me to speculate. Then you will soon see him. The great Zara. Hmm. Twenty tree walkers are waiting outside. You're surrounded. What? You can't prove anything. I wait. I don't believe you. I am still completely sober. Uh huh. Oh, okay. I guess. Sure. Where do I sign? Excellent. Your plumber's workshop belongs to me. I don't have a workshop. Don't have to sign something. Your word is enough. <laughs> By squam attacks. Everything is running like clockwork. Squam. Squamates, that's right. Lizards. <laughs> like a straw? So, where is Zara? You are still... Still awake. Slurp. Soon, yeah. You will sleep and see the great Zara. His vengeance is our triumph. Now my brothers will have to respect me. They'll have to. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. You, uh, thirsty? Better not. Mm. I've still got a lot of money and stuff to spend. That's a problem. You want to see Zaroff like all the others? Yeah. The spell seems to work more slowly on him. Ah, 
It's no problem. Then I'm sure you would be glad to sign another contract. Then you will soon see him. The great Zarov. I've heard your brothers talking about you. What? I knew it. Those underhanded. Wait, I don't believe you. I am still completely sober. Uh huh. Sure, a bird never flew on one wing. What a weird contract. Excellent. Saying. Your securities now belong to me too. <laughs> so you are still still awake. Soon you will sleep and see the great Zara. His mask eyes are rolling around. I think. I'm a little bit tipsy. <laughs> that's me when I'm tipsy. <laughs> I've still got a lot of money. And that's a you want like yeah. Okay. The spells. Ah, then I'm sh then you the gr uh. The price for acorns and nuts just crashed. Hick. What? Hick. Hick. This was all for nothing. I oh, I feel. Dizzy, my brothers will laugh at me. All worthless. We will be exposed. Oh, now their eyes are going shifty backwards or back and forth. Every lizard for himself. Oh, oh gosh. Looks like the sparkling wine went to his head. Uh. The weird guy is stuck in the armor, but how do I get him out of there? Good question. Let's see if it works. Oh, wow. An idea I had actually fucking worked. Excuse my language, I guess. That itches. Oh, he looks so much better without the mask. Oh, no. That was fun. Run, run, child. Where did that lizard get to now? He ran out here, didn't he? He's invisible, so maybe I should use my hagstone. Oh, what? What? Oh, there he is. I think something might have forked a bit there. Curses! I've done nothing wrong! Absolutely nothing. No, nothing. Quia, you gonna sit in the basket? Nope, you're gonna hop on the desk. Not on the desk, honey. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Uh, apparently thirsty. Thirsty? How about some fresh, cold water? Water? Mm, that sounds nice. You dear. Dear boy. <sighs> Snap. <laughs> There's nothing in here. Least the whole world of its possessions to be happy. If, if a sip of water from the hand of a business partner like you, no, a friend, <laughs> could refresh me more than signing any. Well, you talk a lot, man. Bottoms up. <sighs> there we go. I did it. I caught the lizard. Finally. You can get dizzy from all that talk. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, back to the magician's house. Let's go. Uh, that. Oh. How do I get to the magician's house? I don't remember. Okay, this is the way. Hey man. Now what? The marquee has disappeared. And so is my home. 
the Marquis. So that is why something dark has infested the heart of the portal system. I will attempt to learn more about it in order to help Mousewood and return home. You must bring me the lizards. Use the banishing bottles I gave you. Remember, the lizards must open the bottles. Okay, yes. <laughs> Bloom. You have captured the remaining three lizards. Now we have all four. Now they can no longer cause mischief in Mousewood. This time, they travel in the shadow of a much greater disaster. Something dark has infested the heart of the portal system. Only a tree walker can put an end to this disaster. Only a magician who was trained by the Marquis. Okay, I was gonna say, are you a tree walker or are you just a magician? Me? But Your training is almost complete, but there is one final task you have to face. Choose your coat. Oh. What? <laughs> At the end of training, every magician chooses the coat that suits him best. You pass through four portals. You learned four spells. Now the time has come. Which is the robe that belongs to you? Uh, do I get a look at more than one? Endless coats and jackets, robes and parkas, and they all look like they've been well worn. Hmm. Is one of these coats really right for me? I guess I only have another one other option to. Ah, this one looks a lot like the coat the Marquis is wearing. Oh, that's true. That is definitely not for me. Oh, I thought it looked nice though. I hope he's all right. I feel a bit sorry now that I yelled at him like that. This one looks like adventure, thrills, and fierce battles at sea. Yes, very nautical. I like that sort of thing. And yet... No, I don't think I should pick it. What a fancy suit. Yeah. This could certainly belong to a great illusionist. And yet, it's not for me. It doesn't go with your pants. Wow. Oh boy. Dashing. More like a comic. Whoa, a classic. But again, it's not mine. Are you going with this simple... Yes, it is. <laughs> the red one. The wizardy one is... Oh wait, which one? The wizard one or the comic one? Because I could see either way. I like the wizard one though. For Spike. This is the kind of suit that would cause a TV screen yeah. to flicker if a talk show host was wearing it. That's not what I want either. Oh, okay. Uh, we're out of coats. Ooh, I see light coming through a small opening. Wait a second. Is that a keyhole? Do I have a key? No. Aha! Where there's a keyhole, there's usually a... Door. Oh, I thought you were gonna say a key. And then I'm like, okay, you gotta search the pockets or something? This is my bedroom? Huh? But this is my bedroom! It is! Am I back home then? Back in my own time. How the, did I get here? The car, uh... Dreaming, Jerry. Nobody knows rug. this room better than you do. Here, it only exists in your mind's eye. I see. Yeah. So, what am I doing here? This is all nothing but a dream. The truth you will find here. The knowledge that you repressed is more than real. Pick your coat, Jerry. Pick the robe that belongs to you. My coat? Where would I find a coat here? There's plenty of cool stuff in my room. But as far as coats go... Hello? Are you talking to me, Jerry? What? <laughs> no, okay. No reply. Magic's all well and good, but we still need to work on communication. Whoa, so many things to look at. Door, door, rug, books, under the bed, desk, empty school bag.
Oh, he brought up the glow in the dark stars earlier. Glow in the dark. They make me feel all warm inside. Oh, that's sweet. They don't seem all that great now. My idols. Outer space. The final frontier. These are the adventures of Jeremiah Hazelnut, magician space cadet. In a helicopter. Totally interesting. My books about conjuring and magic, and a couple of books with tales about magicians solving crimes. Huh. Not bad. Okay, maybe. Oh yeah, models in the ceiling. So it referred to these ones as well. Yeah, I know. You can see I made it myself, but at least I did make it. Yeah. Oh, there's my summer reading list. My English teacher wanted me to read and summarize an utterly tedious book from way back when, during our vacation. Doesn't matter now. I can still do that tomorrow night. Probably. Uh, with assignments like that, it always bothered me because I want to get things done immediately, right away, and then not have to worry about it for like the rest of the summer or, the, you know, whatever. But if you do that, then you don't remember it at all by the time it comes to turn it in. It's like, well, I did it, but I don't remember. I still haven't packed my book bag, not even in my dream. <sighs> if only I could go home again, I'd pack it then. <sighs> I'd pack it right away. Okay, I'm trying to make sure I click on Sorry, things that won't have a coat in them. That's what Mum always says, even when it's not about wizardry. Still, I put all the old school books she gave me on the boring pile. Mm. Hey, I'm a child. I'm easily bored. Uh, Saka says, yeah, me too, but I, but I have pretty good retention if it's not like mathematics. Math is one of those things where you use it or you lose it entirely. Like, if you've learned it before, it's not going to be hard to relearn it, but if you don't use it every day, you're not going to retain the information. Uh, okay. I used to play with my toy cars on that, and I always wondered why real roads aren't made from rugs. Um... I'm not gonna bother answering that for you, Jerry. There's nothing under my bed. Or is there? Or is there? There's lots of stuff under your bed. Nope, nothing there. Mum was right. Okay. Um... So many people in the U.S., I think, had a specific car rug or carpet. Um, I had a quilt that my mom had made from a um, a panel. What, what, what would it be called? Like, the top of the quilt was just one piece of fabric instead of quilting. You know, quilted pieces or whatever. Um, so mine was always different from everybody else's, and I always really liked that. Plus, it had little cute bears on it. I still have it. Hi, Toby. It's, uh, somewhere safe. So it doesn't get ruined. Okay. Now places that could potentially have coats. Yeah. This is my wardrobe, but how could the wardrobe lead me here? Maybe the wardrobe was made from the wood of a portal tree. Ooh, now you're thinking... No. Oh. Wait. The magician said this is nothing more but a dream, and he said I should pick my coat. Looks like my coat isn't in there. Lots of coats, except for mine. It's good world building though, Jerry. Very fun. Uh, bathroom. Not a bathroom, okay. I was gonna say, if you have an attached bathroom, my goodness. Underneath the carpet? Sports stuff, old picture books, and my comic collection. Oh my! I bet the next issue of Dimension Upsilon will be totally awesome. <laughs> Are the crocodile people really going to attack London? Um, Upsilon, that's... A German letter? Is it also a Greek letter? Mm. Whoa! Oh, okay, let's try the door now. I think I have a television in the living room. I wonder if Mum's home. It's closed. Never mind. If this is only a dream, huh, the Mum's probably somewhere else altogether, waiting for me. Ah, oh, that's right. 
There's a storage hole here. Mum said that this was originally intended for some stairs to the basement. Huh. There's nothing here now but a few dusty boxes. Whoop. Dusty boxes. Just dusty like boxes that. from your missing father, perhaps? Musty cardboard box. Pile of newspapers. Wonderful world of knowledge. I think Mum collected those when she was little. I've already rummaged through all this stuff. Back then, they believed that by now everyone would fly to work with little propellers. <laughs> I sure hope we do by the time I grow up. Me too, kid. I'm sure there's nothing in there but old junk. Oh, <gasps> what's that? An old leather jacket. Never seen it before. But something tells me. Yes. As much as I, I feel. Pick your coat, Jerry. That's my coat. Pick the robe that belongs to you. This robe belongs to me. As much as I feel bad about cows, etc., um, leather coats are pretty great. It was only a dream. Yet you have chosen. You are a tree walker, magician. But, but this coat, it. You are beginning to remember. Who owns this coat, Jerry? I... it's... it's like a hole in my memory. There is somebody. I saw him at the portal trees too. He called my name. Who was it? I... Look <gasps> at this... I got the card! My... my father! It's my father! Who was oh, a magician? No. How could I forget him? Where is he? It's me. I I'm oh, something I'm your dad. Your world, Jeremiah, seeking a beginning. But when it entered your world, something else had to leave. Your father was torn from your world and even from the memory of his family. Oh no. Hmm. Where? Where is he now? He wanders the space between the worlds. You were able to sense his presence near the portals where the boundaries blur. There is only one way to help him. Only one way. Good luck. I hope his story has a happy ending. What are you doing? What? Oh. The Hall of Apprentices. What are we doing here? We must make our way to the clearing of the first okay. tree. I can't stay long. I have piano lessons to get too soon. Signs were obvious, but I overlooked them for too long. What signs? The posters. The lizards. A spell has been cast on the first tree. A forbidden magic which is spreading to all the portal worlds. The posters? Right. The people of Mousewood were completely obsessed with the idea of seeing the great Zaroff, but nobody knew where he was. He must have worked a spell in the clearing of the first tree. Through the corruption of the first tree, Zaroff has projected himself as an obsessive idea which spreads like the plague. The Lizard Consortium has exploited this situation, the mania of the inhabitants of Mousewood now he draws them to the clearing of the first tree in their dreams. The Marquis knew about it. So that was the danger he was talking about. But why did he disappear? We must break Zaroff's curse. Only then will we be able to rescue the inhabitants of the portal worlds and restore the balance. Only then will your portal be able to lead you back home. Only then will your father find his way back to your world. What do I have to do? Oh! Oh, that's not... Oh, okay. It's the Master and the Apprentice. The Hall of Apprentices confirms what I already knew. You are a true tree walker. Your training is complete. You must find the fifth portal. However, the tree walkers have sealed it. A sound carrier is hidden in this hall. It is the key to opening the path to the clearing of the first tree. The device can be used to transport sounds. Hmm. I will attempt to reach the clearing in active sleep. I hope to meet you there. I wish you luck. I... <sighs> wow. It's Spike. 
Just kidding. Before it is too late. Um. Yes. So we caught the lizards. We went back to this guy. We went into a memory, and came out of it and learned that um, when somebody came into this world or came into Jerry's world, his dad was taken away, including the memory of him. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. I didn't notice the beings, the apprentice beings, I just noticed the master beings. Um, hello? Oh, oh, I see. I was looking up, so it wants me to use the leaf. That must be the sound carrier the magician talked about. I can't see what it is. It's teeny tiny. And now we're oh. Portal. Oh, goodbye, Hall. Yes! Tonight, once again, I'd better hurry. This stupid tree that I've been wanting to do something. <laughs> okay. Look at this little cute guy. Woo! Huh, that probably isn't the sound to take along. Uh, supposedly, you can carry sounds in that. Do I put it in here? Uh, that probably isn't the sound. Okay, now I just hold it up to this thing. I did. Hey, it's starting to vibrate in my hand. And it sounds just like the wind blowing through that hollow stump. This is crazy. Um Right. I got the last three dewdrops. I thought it was two, but it was three. And all we learned from it was that the marquee had a magician before me. Sorry, had a, a an apprentice before me. I think that's all that we learned. Mm, so. What kind of stone is that? It is firmly stuck. No idea what it is. Okay, I wasn't paying that much attention. Uh, that probably isn't the sound to take along. I've already done that. Okay. Hey, it's starting to vibrate in my hand. And it sounds just like the wind blowing through that hollow stump. Okay, what am I supposed to do with it though? It looks interesting over there as well. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, so I need to bring the sound somewhere else. Where am I supposed to bring it? First tree? I like how we to this day carry our rit ritual instructions around. Like what? Uh, this way. The letter. Oh. No, it's a mysterious message. The ritual we got rid of a long time ago. I'm supposed to find the fifth tree, so I'm guessing that it's not actually one of the- it's not actually this one. No? No. Oh! oh. Ah. The little crystal statue is starting to vibrate, just like the sound carrier. Whoa! Oh, the whistling of the wind at the portal tree made the little statue shatter. Huh. The whistling of the wind okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I not allowed to pick the stuff up? Take yeah, take that. Huh. And I have seen it. Okay. Guess I gotta go around to those other crystals. I'm honestly surprised that it worked. I wasn't expecting it to. It makes sense now that it's happened, but it's just like, well, let's try it on this thing. Oh, 
Oh-ho! Aha! The little crystal statue is starting to vibrate, just like the sound carrier. Oh, the whistling of the wind at the portal tree made the little statue shatter. I'm glad I didn't have to, uh, take that. get different sounds for the different ones. Didn't change. Hello. Thank you, Ocifer. Thanks for the bits. Oh, what? But that's it looks like he just fell apart. Now there's only a pebble and a couple of twigs. Huh. Okay. Um, where are the other trees? Oh, no, not that one. <laughs> Excuse me. You! Ooh, woo! Uh... Oh, here we go. I got started crocheting a dragon dragon pattern, and uh, I want one for myself now. <laughs> ooh, woo, it's number one. It's true. I don't think so. Ooh, woo is a popular thing. Uh, okay, tree, 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 there was one this way. Okay, where was the other tree? Oh, 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 the whistling of the wind at the portal tree huh. made the little statue shatter. I'd better take that. The, uh... The head and coin were in two places at once for a second there. I'm gonna still try this, but... Yeah. See, now we can hear it. You've lost something, but somebody else is already looking for it. Okay, we've got a heart with a thing around it. A hand. An eye. Okay. Oh, the fox one. That's it. So, the swamp. Oh, this one's the other hand. Or maybe the same hand. The little crystal statue is starting to vibrate, just like the sound carrier. Nobody told me life was gonna be ooh woo. <laughs> Very cute. Epic Uwu One claims to be Lucifer. Huh. Okay, now what do I do with these? That probably needs to be inserted somewhere. It's... Oh. It doesn't fit there. Okay. It doesn't fit there. Toby, what are you doing on the on the desk? Oh, come here. Mm -hmm. Kittens on desks get kisses. And who's done multiple fan arts of me. Nice. One isn't a very devilish number. It's the loneliest number. Okay, where do I insert these coins? I don't need to do it with, like, the nails or anything, right? That seems weird. I don't know. I think the uwu in our... In our presence... Oh, there is a... There is a thing for blue juice. It doesn't fit that. Yeah, I mean, like, that'd be weird. Presence is the real Lucifer. <laughs> I don't... I don't think this is where we're supposed to put them, but I'll give it a shot anyways. It 
doesn't fit there. Okay. Um. Trying to remember locations. So. I'll just walk into everything. Probably don't need an a woo off. Okay, and I don't think the dwarves need coins in their stuff. Alright, uh, this one doesn't have any place to put coins. It smells pretty Not the boot, child. Not the boot. Okay, nothing here. Watch these guys. No. Oh, Neptune. Oh, suddenly everyone starts snapping their fingers. <laughs> like the sharks and the jets. Okay, this is probably locked. Closed. Too bad. It looks comfy even at How night. about magic? What, use magic on the coins? I can't. Uh, I cast fist. Shh. Okay, I'm taking a little look here. The old tree stump. Oh yeah, I didn't notice, but there's there's nobody around anymore. Stump? Old tree stump. Isn't that the one in my world? Okay, where is there a stump, guys? Is it is it the hollow thing? Where I got the sound? I considered going there, but I was I decided not to for some reason. Okay, and I'm back. Had to get my knockoff Chicka Filet Luckets out of the air fryer. Nice. Snacks are important. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. This way? But I can't get a you can't cast a magical barrier and cast fireball in the same turn, Mats. You have to wait to the next turn. It doesn't fit there. Okay, well first- shush, 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 child. First let's go up there. Instead of- Okay, it is a stump. Only a hollow tree stump. There's nothing in it. The wind is getting cool. Blah, 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 blah. Poet. Oh, okay, child, if you say so. Unless you're playing 1.5 and you get a reaction spell. These nerds are nerdier than me. <laughs> Which is okay, I like you guys. Okay. <gasps> a door! That must be the passage the old magician was talking about. What a weird spot to have the keyhole, though. Whoa! Uh... Creepy. This is some... This is some sci-fi fantasy book stuff. I have made nuggies and mini tacos for lunch. Sam's Club has good freezer snacks this week. <laughs> nice. How odd. How odd what? You just... How oh! Odd. 
You're changing them. Forget it. I can't work it out. Well, if you let me actually do stuff. Forget it. I... I've got... Wait, what? You've got it? Somehow this doesn't fit. Oh. No... Oh, sorry. I'm clicking too fast. There's no way this can be solved. It's hopeless. I've got it. No, I haven't. Okay, let's... Okay, that thing. Fountain. Statue. A glass statue of a caterpillar. It's holding a panel with various picture tiles. Why is it smiling so mysteriously? How can you tell? Mini taco sounds fun. They're so good. They're real corn tortillas too. Yeah, I'm... I mean, they may have changed since I was young, but... The key is hovering in the middle of the jet. The way it smells, I'd better not stick my hand in there. Uh, yeah, but, uh, the... We used to get the mini tacos from Sam's Club. And they were good. Uh, a little greasy, but good. A taco once? Only once? I suppose it's not like they have a lot of Mexican culture in the Netherlands. I mean, we don't have much for real tacos where we live, but they're, we still get tacos. Uh, maybe twice. What is that smell? It's really burning my eyes and the inside of my nose. It must be an acid fountain. That is downright mean. Can I knock the key out with this brush? That doesn't oh, push. Uh, where's the stick when you need it, right? Okay, uh, da -da, whisper. Oh, it's glass and not rock, but maybe. Oh, you should give up. But. Fight on. Filled with hope. Can you do that? Okay, so use the hope. Nothing. Too bad. What? Here. Use it here then. Oh, that's cheating. I could never stand these sliding puzzles anyway. I like sliding puzzles. I was like, finally, a puzzle I can do. Uh oh. Yeah. Better get back to solid ground there, kid. That doesn't sound good. Oh man. That yeah. was a shave. Very insightful child. Hmm. Oh. Hey, bourgeois. The portal to the clearing of the first tree. The time has come. If only the what child do, child? Or the old magician. He was going to try and meet me there in his dreams. I hope it works. But for now, I appear to be on my own. <sighs> oh, hello. Hello, Kitsune. Watch out, Jerry. Oh, you don't sound like Kitsune. Oh, there we go. That's why. Oh, it's not Kitsune. It's one of the others? No, it's Kitsune. But where is it now? Right in front of you, frog. Ooh. Plato, this is Kitsune. You've met her before. She's a very special fox. You can say that again. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know the first thing about magic and such like. Except for Anya's lingonberry pancakes. Oh, that sounds <laughs> good. Sooner, Plato, what are you doing here? I won't let you go through there by yourself, silly boy. Silly boy. This tree smells funny. Your path will take you to a place that not even I know. Uh -huh. You are definitely going to need my help. My parents used to tell me about the first tree walkers. They said a tree walker is someone who will help others when they're in need. So why is you are a tree walker, Jerry? I'm nothing but a simple. Plato not oh, asleep. Perhaps I can be a tree walker too. <gasps> yeah. I'm so glad I won't have to do this by myself. Right, Jerry. Let's get it over with. 
Whoever's disturbing the worlds will have to Teamwork. ask for it. I want to return home. I want my friends to wake up again. And I want everything to be okay again. Everything. Oh, okay. Kitsune just teleported to the same spot. Oh, this was at the beginning of the game. Plato? Kitsuna? Where did they go? They were walking right next to me. And the story collector was here, but now he's a pile of rubble, apparently. Dark, but lighter at the same time. The air feels electric somehow. All the little hairs on my arms are standing on end. Oh. Huh. Path into the light. Bright path. Unknown. Into the white. No, stay away from the light. Is this the right way? Oh. Oh dear. This might be the path. Here. Again. This is giving me a headache. Well, we're gonna try all of them. This might be the path. Epic Awoo uh zero one. Hi. Zero one. No, Epic Awoo one. Someone called the devil to kick his butt in a Mexican standoff, I heard. Game on then. Hello and welcome. Yeah, we have an Awu here. A Wucifer that uh Matt's thought you guys needed to fight. I think I'm moving in circles. I wish I knew what to do. Maybe I can get through to the Marquis or the old magician from here after all. No, a Wucifer's here. I believe o o our Wucifer uses she her pronouns. Yes, you okay. Okay, that didn't change anything. Um, we don't have any rocks to talk to in here. Maybe Kitsune can hear the bell. Can't I can't use it on anything apparently. Um. Oh, and Plato could maybe hear the clicker. But I can't. You, I don't know how to use it. Uh, but hey, my mug is empty. Nothing. Too bad. Nothing. Too bad. Nothing. Too bad. Let's see. Matt's. At Matt's. Good question. How will you be? Res no. That you will be responsible for anything that happens. Nothing. Too bad. No stars to look at. Okay, I don't have any indication that going through any of these in a specific order is doing anything. Uh, no stars. Not today. Yeah. The stars are not in position for this kind of ceremony. Stars. Can't do it. Not today. Uh, blah, blah. Apparently, I'm supposed to use this spell. Jerry. Hello? Jerry, so far, I haven't been able to advance to the clearing. I need to... to be careful and not lose sight of my goal. My waking More mind has started rope. a dream to dissolve. Zaroff denies me access. But you appear to be closer to him already. But I'm stuck here. What can I do? You are between the worlds, just like me. But while Zaroff is misdirecting my spirit, he is leading your body astray. 
Zaroth's curse is strong. I know only one who wields enough power to help you here, between the worlds. A dangerous magician. Take this. This looks familiar. You need to summon him, like you did once before. Oh. Even if we may all come to regret it. But when you ask him for help, do not show any weakness. Okay. Hello? Our magician? He's gone. Ah, alone again. You didn't ask uh, Lucifer if she wanted to fight. What's that noise? Ah, that would be ah. me. Not another crow. Raven. Not another... Wait, you can talk. Some even say I talk too much. Ha 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 ha. Uh... Also, I believe a Mexican standoff is three people. But... What have I done but also told Uwu exactly what he wanted to see happen? Yeah, I don't believe our Lucifer said anything about it. Yeah. Um, hello? Ah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Of course. You're right in front of me, aren't you? I'll keep trying my luck. If you want a name, I'm afraid I must disappoint you. I'm only a raven. Actually, I live in the clearing of the first tree. The clearing of the first tree? That's where I need to go. Do you know the right way? I can't find it myself. Everything's changed here, especially with all those strangers hanging around now. <sighs> I'm just chilling, drawing, eating nugs, and watching the game get played. Who did you see here? First, there were four strange looking lizards who followed a tall man into the clearing. Oh. Bye, but Mats. Good luck. Next came a rabbit with funny eyes. The Marquis. I flew after him, but he entered your world. I could not follow him there. Why not? Because I come from here, from the memories of the first tree. There is no place for me outside of dreams. If I were to enter your world, something or someone would be lost in my place. Ah! <gasps> Huggies. There are a few who can move about in your realities without disturbing the balance. They animate rocks and plants, and thus walk between dream and reality. Oh, I think I know someone like that. <sighs> um... What kind of place is this? You're at the threshold between dream and reality. Dream and reality? Dreamers come to visit my clearing in their dreams. Everyone knows how to get to this place. A sleeper knows the way. But I'm not asleep, and I can't find the way. That makes two of us. A voice just now said that you could ask someone for help. Yes, but how? He said that you've done it before. Hmm. Somebody came here once to meditate about his past. He thought up this wheel. What wheel? This wheel. Huh? If you turn the wheel, the crossroads will show you paths that are hidden deep in your soul. Places you have seen. Places you are going to see. A little Yoda-like. Places that have shaped your life. Even if you never realized it, perhaps it can help you. But they are not true paths. Just windows or images. I don't know much about these things. I'm only a raven. Only a raven. Um, yeah, join in with uh, chilling stuff. May not have huggies, but I have chips. And yeah, I'm pretty. I was pretty sure you meant nuggies, and you did. You live in the clearing of the first tree. Yes. But I thought the first tree wasn't the real tree. How can anyone live there? That's Pizza, easy. yeah. Everyone leaves behind a memory when departing from the clearing of the first tree. 
A raven like me visited the clearing in a dream. When he left, I stayed behind as a memory of the tree. So you're just a memory? Just? I think that's a whole lot. The first dream remembers many things. Even after its time had ended, it remained rooted in the woods. It knows the secrets of the forest. Okay. Spike's missing out on uh, snack time that everybody else has, it seems. And Epic Uwu is also drawing and has to go. Thanks for stopping by, Epic Uwu. If you are interested in joining us again sometime, that'd be great. If not, it was nice to see you. All right. Uh, bye bye. <laughs> ah, thanks for the follow. Oh, cutie Morgan there. Okay. Um. I'll keep trying my luck. See you later. Wow. Good luck. Ah. All I have right now is crackers. But I did have a Chilito earlier. Earlier. Oh. Strange. They're not even paths anymore. Almost looks like windows to different places. Okay, so we've got the the wall with the cannon, the uh, hungry squirrel statue, um, campfire. I'm not sure where that's supposed to be. The city flooded. Oh, oh, it's San Francisco. It's not uh, the city that he lives next to, and uh, some place with a lighthouse that we can't see very well. Yeah, um, the only place I've ever gotten them, gotten Cholitos from, is, uh, Zantigo. It used to be called Zapata. Uh, it's a tortilla with, like, I looked up a hack way to do it before. So it's essentially a, a tortilla with cheese and, like, canned chili mixed together. Uh, and then rolled up. It's very tasty, despite what it sounds like. Um, I guess a lot of people probably say it's pretty boring, but I like it. Mm, tree bark. Eve! Oh! Mm -hmm. Oh, spooky! Okay, we've got the clock tower room, the one of these uh, tree walker signs, the dwarves closet, a suitcase, and an angler fish. Okay, we only have the two. Let's check out this guy. He looks familiar. Hello, old friend. He reminds me of home. Oh, we're not actually going through them. That's one of the cannons belonging to the guards of Mousewood. It looks like I might be able to stick in my hand from here. How strange, indeed. I now have a handful of black powder. What a weird thought <laughs> to do. Let's stick my hand in it. I think I saw this bridge before. On television. Looks like nobody lives in those houses anymore. Almost like my home, the last time I saw it. Okay, maybe this does have the, uh... The recipe in it. There's a weird symbol in the poem underneath it. How he made a carrot flame. After drawing on rock, a symbol all in white. Grinding white to powder makes it right. Then add black in turn. The kind you should be loath to burn. Black and white as they combine. The inside of your vessel line. Then three more things. Tree skin, tree fruit, and lastly but not least, a root. At the crossroads, draw a circle with the powder mix obtained. Put the vessel in the center of the powder ring, thus gained. Set the circle bang on fire. The carrot flame leaps higher and higher, and I will swallow it in haste to enjoy the lovely taste. 
first one. Oh, a cozy campfire. I think there's even someone sitting there. Whoever they may be, I'm going to borrow a log of wood. Oh, okay. Ouch, hot. Now what? <sighs> There's nothing to light it with. I don't. Oh, I almost burnt my fingers. Before I start a fire, I should know okay. exactly what I need it for. That's a fair point. Eve. Oh. I can't. Oh no, I, I can interact with this one. Mm. I think I can reach the next from here. Here we go. Tree fruit. Ha! I swiped a few acorns. Funny. They're so small. Looks like I'm no longer the size of a mouse. I hmm. hope this won't plunge the people of Mousewood into an acornomic crisis. Oh well. It's all oh for a boy. good cause. This stone looks like the one by the brook near the Temple of the Moths. A tree walker symbol has been carved onto it. <laughs> the same symbol I drew on the face of the rock toad. Okay. Is that a wire cutter? Looks like someone tried to stuff it in the case. I'm not planning on dragging that thing along. I think it's stuck in the ice. Mm-hmm. Hands off. Hey, this is the dwarf's locker. And it is still locked. <laughs> Okay, we don't have a carrot yet. Mm. Oh, I was gonna try to write on that thing with the pepper, but from here I can see the sea. I can almost smell the salt water. This is really better than TV. Okay, we need to write on on rock with white powder or with something. That doesn't need any special spice. Hmm. Eve. Oh. <sighs> Maybe it's a work here as well. Okay. That's what I thought. Now, I use the powder to draw the symbol of the tree walkers. I hope this counts. Okay. Okay, yeah, gotta make the pa uh, these two put together. Okay. Um, and then we gotta put them in the cup. It's in. Do we actually have a carrot for this recipe or not? Hmm. Wait, we need to draw a circle? Okay, let's let's listen then to this three thing. more things: tree skin, tree fruit, and lastly but not least, a root. Bark won't be much. Hmm. Also in. Okay, I had to do that one first, I guess. Also in. I don't have a root though. Where do I get the root? Doesn't fit there. Oh. Plato, go in there and uh that won't work. And open the door for me. Uh, not with this. Come on. Man, I hope this is just an illusion. Wouldn't want to be arrested as a burglar after all. 
Okay, I prized the door open. Oh no, my stick broke. No! Okay, now everything is in. I. There's a weird symbol in the poem underneath it. Mm -hmm. How he made, mm -hmm. after drawing on rock, a symbol all in white. Mm -hmm. Then add black into mm -hmm. black and white. Mm -hmm. Then three more things. Mm -hmm. At the crossroads, draw a circle with the powder mix obtained. Put the vessel in the center of the... Set the circle bang on fire. Okay. Let's get to the fire. Uh, circle. Circle? 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 Wait, at the crossroads? Uh, no. Uh, no. Circle? Uh, no. Um. Uh, no. <laughs> Child, help me out here. There's a weird ship. Uh -huh. How he after uh -huh. draw it, then uh -huh. black and uh -huh. then three more things. Uh -huh. At the crossroads, draw a circle with the powder mix obtained. Put the vessel in the center of the powder ring, thus gain. Set the circle bang on fire. The carrot flame leaps higher and higher, and I will swallow it in haste to enjoy the lovely taste. <sighs> Did I not try right here? I clicked places, but not this place, apparently. No? I think I've got everything I need. I wonder if it'll work, even though I've modified the recipe a little. Okay, now get the car. Ouch! Hot! Now what? What do you mean now? What? You got a brain, don't you? This is better work. Or else. Whoa. Your name. Hi. Tell me your name. Uh, uh I'm Jerry. Uh, Jerry Hazelnut. Jeremiah. Jeremiah Human. How were you able to summon me to this place? I drew a circle of powder on the crossroads. Very few have knowledge of this ritual. It takes inner strength to complete it successfully. Only the strong are worthy of our magic. Is it the Marquis? Walking between worlds. I can see strength within you. So why did you call me? I need help so I can find the great Zaroff. Zaroff, Zaroff. He dares to leave his world. I never thought he could be that strong. <laughs> Maybe I was wrong about him. I I'm stuck here. All the parts are leading me in circles. This place is now a trap, leading back to itself. A dark spell must have been cast. Whoever cast it must have had a brilliant teacher. Mm -hmm. The old magician said I should ask you for help. Aro Molina. Oh yeah. That is why your spell did not release me. That is why I am still trapped in the crystal. Of course, he allows me no more than these few words. But even that is a miracle. Um, what you are doing must be very important to him. But how do I get out of here? A trap like this always has a way to allow the one who set it to pass through it unharmed. I sense that you are carrying a magical coin. The spell it bears is very familiar to me. Because you made it? But it is not perfect. That's uh, creepy. I just bestowed a 
gift upon you. The coin will now show you the path when you carry it through this place. Follow its light, but you must take heed. Wandering aimlessly in this place forever might be a mercy compared to what awaits you when you follow the coin's lead. <laughs> Goodbye. Who was that? A friend of yours? No, I don't think so. You might want to try what the masked magician told you. You will no longer need these places. I hope you find your way to the clearing. Although I would much prefer to keep chatting with you. Wah. Wah. Um, I was just thinking, I wonder if the, like, muttering an incantation is creepy to me, because it's, uh, like, mysti mysticism or mystical in the real world, stuff that my culture has really shied away from, and, uh, so I automatically viewed it as creepy because it's, it's different and other. So, I'm curious if other people thought nothing of it. And if it's my own bias just putting me there. Um, Jerry? This might be the path. Oh man, everything looks the same here. Am I? This is where the paths cross. I'm sorry. What did the guy say to do? Uh, Sake does not personally find it creepy in that way. Just interesting and like, ooh, what's happening? Hmm. Is this the right path now? Here. Again, this is given. Sorry, I have to ask if this bird plays quartets. It is not the game that is crucial, but the motives. Oh. Oh, the light. Okay. Well, maybe this way. Wait, didn't I try that one? Maybe I tried the top one. Oh man, I think I'm moving in circles. I wish I knew what to do. Maybe I can get through to the Marquis or the old magician from here after all. Is this the right path now? I bet this was wrong. There's a hint with the ring and purple. Okay, it's brighter in the direction you're supposed to go. Thank you. Is this the right way? Oh, it looked like it was bright here. I was gonna go in the wrong one if I didn't check. Well, maybe this way. Here, again. This is giving me a headache. I did that again. This might be the path. Oh man. I think I'm moving in circles. I wish I knew what to do. Maybe I can get through to the mo Did I do it wrong? Or maybe this way. Ugh, well. This must be bum, 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 the bum, bum, the first tree. I see a volunteer who would like to participate in this magic performance. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please give him a hand? Oh, the shadows of all of the people. It's really amazing. Uh, 
Uh, hi, creepy. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a volunteer. What about ladies? Hmm? Ladies and gentlemen. Emptlemen. Gentle thems. With my clairvoyance, I looked right into your heart. This game is a little old. A child. Jeremiah, I was once just like you. Then I faced the cruel reality. The facts. That describes me very well. A gentle mess. When he locked me out of those incredible worlds. But our world is not a place for magic. <laughs> no matter how brilliant you are, success is impossible. But I'm sure he didn't tell you that. Nothing is impossible. <laughs> Only for him. You will soon realize that. He should never have sent you. He will soon come to realize his mistake. Perhaps he will grieve for you more than he did for me. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. You still have much to learn. The audience, they love only me. <laughs> But we have wasted enough time. And now! A one and a two. Ladies and, and gentlemen! <laughs> you know what to do. I am banishing this boy into the wood of the first tree. No! Uh, was I supposed and to do anything that, there? Honorable audience! Is magic! Is magic! <laughs> Jerry, can you hear me? We haven't got much time. My magic isn't strong enough to ward off Zarov's curse for long. He banished you into the first tree. I tried to shield your mind from the clutches of his black magic as best I could. Do not falter, Jerry. Be on your guard. Zarov's spell nails have darkened the soul of the first tree. Others must be trapped in its magical wood as well. Go and find them. Do not succumb to fear, Jerry. You must not give up. Must not give up. Not give up. Give up. Must give up. Uh, you must saw that coming. Up. <laughs> not for very long, but... Where, where am I? I? I must have fallen asleep. Oh, thank goodness. It's worried for a second. Right in front of a portal tree. Huh. And he wants to be a tree walker? Oh. Are you the leprechaun? What a sacrilege. Ah. <laughs> oh, hi Pluto. Plato. Plato. I'm sorry. sorry. But my friend Jerry needs help again. I haven't got time for strangers. Strangers? But I am Jerry. He thinks that cardboard figure is me, and he doesn't remember me at all. Oh, I want to do anything. What wretch is this? Daring to disturb the quiet of the stone frog? The toad Cut toad. It really didn't like being woken up. Hi. Oh, you got posters on your face. Forest. Silly little Jerry was actually dumb enough to approach a dangerous giant. <laughs> like the path of thorns. I should talk to it. Maybe it knows how I can get out of here. An excellent idea. <laughs> well, if you think it's excellent, I don't want to do it. You want to move around? Silly little nope. Jerry is completely befuddled. 
You mean I'm a lousy friend because I won't give you my bike? My mic? Will this do anything? That's a really good idea. Is it? Hmm, I guess you can't hear me. Oh. Okay. What's this doing here? What have we here? Looks like a script to me. The Curse of Zara. Act One. Silly Little Jerry. I am not silly. <laughs> Hated by all woodlanders. No, that's a lie. An obnoxious moocher through and through. That's not true. Finally trampled to death by the angry rock toad. Oh no. Who would write this nasty stuff? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> what a cry, baby! Nothing is like it seems. You must well, give. Well, well. The spell nails have darkened the soul of the first tree. Just give it up. The lizards. The lizards. Zaroff. Hooray for Zaroff. Thumbs up. I'm so impatient. I, I want to do things and not uh, listen to what they have to say. Jerry. Hello. The toad's breathing rather heavily. No wonder it's got these ugly posters sticking all over its body. I'll try to tear off the posters. Oh. I don't have my stick anymore. I'm going to squish you. Wow. Let's get any closer. You spell disaster for everyone. You used us. I did? You want to hitch a ride on my bike, but I need to deliver the mail. Jerry didn't care what the frog said because he was too lazy to walk. What? I think I used Play Doh like three times total. <laughs> Just not so huge. Toad. Silly little Jerry had never seen such pointy thorns. <laughs> Is that supposed to be me? What do you think? <laughs> we did deliver mail for him, yeah. Jerry ignored the inconspicuous, absolutely insignificant nail. The evil spell nail the old magician mentioned. <sighs> the rock toad's in the way. I need to think of something. Scenery. Okay, can I use this thing? Yeah. Okay, the only thing I didn't click on was this. Two large boulders. That were much too heavy for puny little Jerry, of course. Huh, I'll show you. Oh. See? <laughs> oh, Mum was right. Now it does do a body good. Hmm, I wonder what the switch does. Oh. It switches on the light. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, that canned... Like child laugh. <laughs> the curse of Zara. Oof. Act one. Nothing is like it seems. I must stop Zara. Woohoo, Jerry! Jerry! Curses. Mm, voice tube. Hello? Hello there. Hello. How may I help you? A good friend of mine would like to be back in the limelight. Who's the lucky guy then? A large toad, here on stage. Very well. I can see illuminating this gentleman will be a truly 
daunting task. This looks okay. like a job for a limelight deluxe. They're stuck pretty tight. Take your hands off me, human. They're too firmly attached. I need to think of something else. It's a miracle that the toad can breathe at all with them on his face. These posters are really horrible. Says the silly boy who thinks his space octopus picture from first grade is truly great art. That sounds like a really hey, rad idea. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a terrible teacher. <laughs> okay, what do I do with these chestnuts? You want these? I bet they fit exactly into the toad's nostrils. Um. Okay, 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 okay. Illuminating the toad. Hello? Uh, yes. This looks like. Oh, good. They. Sh they uh, made it much shorter. The usual. Uh oh, the chestnuts went pretty far off his nostrils. Ew. Take your hands off me, human. I Time to sneeze. Ah, chew. Oh, what? Okay. <laughs> My mind. Oh no, the game is having problems. Willing to squish. He's not supposed to have the posters on anymore. My mind is now broken. Ah. Oh. I will now return home. All right. Streams of time. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that good enough for you? <laughs> okay, well, let's try to get Plato back first. Oh, Jerry? Jerry, where have you been? Where have I been? The three of us are in the dark tunnel. And then... Oh, just as long as you're doing all right. I was about to say the same. Oh. Removes the nail. Oh, Who's I thought I needed his help strength-wise. Scribble, scribble. Hey. Hi. What's going on here? Nice turf. Where did Plato go? Unfortunately, Plato, the clumsy amphibian, recently had an accident with his bicycle. No! Oh, really? He broke all his frog legs on an oak while being forced to deliver a useless letter for a certain... Jerry Hazelnut. Ha <laughs> ha! Me and miserable bitch bit. Uh -huh. Hey, look who's here. Spotting Tertador's porky! Maybe he can help. Oh, the music is challenging to continue hearing. Hey, a four-leaf clover. It looks like a three-leaf clover. It's firmly nailed to the ground. There's no way I can rip it out. Don't you touch me, Shamrock! You're no good numpty. <laughs> ah, child laugh. Okay. Sandbags script. Blinded by the gold's insane glitter, Jerry's brain spontaneously decides to explode. Uh. I don't think so. Wait. Oh. Just one moment. Oh my god. Head hurt already? A little, yes. Ha! I'll just carry on then. <laughs> <laughs> Curse of Zoroth, Act 2. Let's see. Without hesitation, Jerry accepts the Leprechaun's gold and in return gives up his hopeless fight. He ceases to live. Oh, 
Oh, I can move now. Uh, sandbags are a thing. Some sandbags hanging there. Oh, oh, faith be God. This reminds me of the famous Irish troll boxer, Crondo McCrusher. Strong as ten bulls he was. He always had punch bags dangling from his ceiling as well. But they weren't filled with sand. They were filled with bodies. <laughs> oh, God. This is dark all of a sudden. Slowly going crazy. Reality itself appeared to be breaking apart. There's something behind it, too. Hmm. Rip. I can't widen it with my hands. Oh. Oh, I have a nail. Right. This should work. Wait, Jerry. Yes? Do you really want to know how deep that rabbit hole goes? Hmm. Excuse me? You're about to uncover a terrible secret. Fine by me. Marquee rabbit hole. Believer? Is that all? Jerry was so disappointed he wanted to die. <laughs> oh boy, that's getting old fast. We're in the up position. And then that drops a sandbag. Or not. Oh, there's the button. Okay. Oh. I wouldn't have expected this, even of a sheep hugger like yourself. Indeed. Nobody had thought that Jerry would be capable of so much wickedness. <laughs> With one stone. If his murderous plan had worked, he would now own all the gold. Oh, and the leprechaun stag, the superior top hat, would have been history. What a rotter! Good. Oh gosh, sorry, I clicked through that. Uh. Uh. <laughs> There's a achievement about. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Something about the guy, and I wonder if it was don't hit him with the sandbag. I think I ruined the lawn. Can I bonk Zaroff in the head then? Oh, nope. Ha! Jerry's lethal trap is sprung, and he steals the poor leprechaun's much more elegant top hat. I just want to get out of here. Dirty thief! Well, who cares? <sighs> you should have wish you had said that a million years ago. <laughs> well, I can't steal this key. Not knows. Oh, the peat bog band cheese. If it isn't, young Jury, the plumber. The plumber. Looks like you're written of me delusion, boy. Thank you ever so kindly. I surely owe you. Should I turn someone into a sheep to stop this madness? Yeah. No, no, no. Turns our off into a into a sheep. Oh, I don't see a nail at all. Donald doesn't like to be beholden to anyone. This wish is on the house. Oh, cute. And rain and wafts of mist. Thanks, Mr. O'Donnell. The curse I was under is broken. I'm going home. Goodbye. And O'Donnell is born for freedom. You'll remember that, you ugly conniving whisperer. Meh, <laughs> harumph. I didn't get a rump out of that guy. Oh, there it is. Da -da. Da -da 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 -da. 
How many acts are in this thing? Oh, at least one more. The <laughs> land of the volcano. Sharp swords and man-eating fox spirits. What a beautiful place to fail in, Jerry Ford. Just give up, Bonehead. Hey. I'm a fox, I swear. Kitsuno. You are trapped in a human's body. No mask can hide that, Kitsune. But humans He's and biting foxes his tongue. can never be friends. But if a human accepts a fox for who she is, doesn't that count? Even if that were the case, why aren't you changing back? I, I, I tried to change back. It, it just won't work. You may wish to be a fox again, but your heart is lost. I shall protect your ears from the confusion wrought by humans. Ugh. Please help me. I shall heal you. The two hands over the shoulders thing is very, like, aggressively protective human. to me. Kitsuna. I'm sure it's not intended to be so most of the time. It's just like, ugh. Okay, what's the script say? Great, a new script. The Curse of Zaroff, Act 3. Little Jerry won't give up. He kept bothering the foxes incessantly. Until they grew tired of the immature smart Alec and devoured him, bones and all. Ouch! In this context, I think it is, because he's forcing her to be immobile and unable to act. Yeah. Got bell posters, little flyers. Oh, and the guy himself. Another one of those nails. A completely insignificant object. Oh, stop it already! My mom always says, "Fool me twice, shame on me." <laughs> you missed a bit of that. The guardian's in the way. Nah. <sighs> Touch that nail. I will bite off your head. Okay. I better keep my distance. Uh. <sighs> More posters. I'll rip them down. Not right now. I smell a human. I may be blind, but my nose never deceives me. We foxes are dangerous animals. Oh no. Kitsuna sounds downright threatening. Gar, I'm so threatening. Gar. Louder. Mm, nothing happened. <laughs> uh, okay. Sake says often, ha often, hands on the sides of the shoulders or cupping the head at the neck is more irreverent and loving because cupped hands usually symbolize in the west at least prayer acceptance holding hmm. i can see that i mean technically his hands are cupped but down and like it makes it look like you're hiding something um whereas palms up is like you know i'm showing i'm not hiding anything it works with animals a bit too um like if you're trying to approach a cat or probably a dog even i've just got much more experience with cats it's good to be below their level so they can see what's going on with you and you're not intimidating and to if you're going to reach for them to reach with your palm up um and slowly so they can see everything that you're doing you don't want them to be surprised by anything so, lovely blue blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's get this bell. Oh, he covered her ears. Boy, Interesting. I can smell your intention, but she cannot hear you. She is mine. <laughs> she is his. <laughs> Okay, so either I ring the bell, well, the bell won't change his smell at all. Uh, 
Okay, or I use the cutting. No? Hello? Hello? I don't think I need an illusion here. I think that's exactly what you need. Apparently not. Back from piano. Ah, are those eyes? Yeah. This isn't gonna work. Foolish boy. Okay. She, she is his. <laughs> Ugh, no. Uh, yes, they are eyes. Welcome back from piano. Uh, let's see. Um, I am under a curse, I guess, by Zaroff, who's in the shell in the bandstand. And I'm going through these uh, acts in a play to remove the nails. And I got two already with um, Plato and the Leprechaun. And now I need to get Kitsune's help to move this one. Remove the nails, save our friends. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. What am I supposed to do here, though? If I can't... I feel like this is exactly what I need to be doing. <laughs> I'm wrong, I though. I... I mean, I guess... I don't think I... Hmm. How would... Let's see what happens when I hold this thing against the bell. Whoa. <sighs> <My ears. laughs> okay. Well, that worked out better than I expected. Kitsuna? Jerry? Are you trying to rob me of my remaining senses? Human! Yeah. I shall have all humans suffer for this. Including your little Kitsune. Kitsune. I swear. You may wish to be a fox again, but your heart is lost. I shall protect your ears from the confusion wrought by humans. Jerry! Quick, Kitsuna, run away! You belong to us! Uh, no. I will always be a fox, Jerry. <laughs> and Jerry's sound carrier shattered in his backpack. Oh, great. No! How come that one had effect, whereas all the, like, Jerry ceased to exist, Jerry's mind, whatever. Oh, it's still here, though. Let's put this one on your face. No? Okay. Uh... I don't know now. I thought that was going to be it. Me be confused, but also enter... Enter... Ente... Ente... I'm presuming entertained? Intrigued? Um... Mm-hmm. Do 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 I use now? I don't think I need an illusion here. I think you do. I do and engaged. Uh it'd be the first one without the D. Yeah. Like that. Uh you want this? Be careful with the shards. You want this? You want this? No. Okay, that's just the same as before. Um, I'll try kicking the bell again, I guess. Hmm. 
Great, a new script. The Curse of Zaroff, Act 3. Little Jerry won't give up. He kept bothering the foxes incessantly. Until... Ouch. <laughs> we read that. Talk to Kitsune. Pish. Kitsuna, are you alright? Jerry, I... Humans and foxes can never be friends. But if a human accepts a fox <sighs> for who she is, doesn't I'm sleepy. You may wish to be a fox again, but your heart is lost. I shall heal you from being human <laughs> or devour you as a human. I can't have it my way. No one gets to have anything. He will keep you forever. Terry, why don't you just leave? I will always remain a fox. I know, and that's a good thing. Yeah. I just noticed the orange things have little white fox tails. That's cute. Grr. Foxes fight. Wink. Okay. Apparently, all I needed to do was talk to her, like Sake said. I am but a blind guardian. Oh. Oh, right, because the posters. Once again, sees clearly. I owe you my thanks, human. Jerry's pouting. Friendship removes the nail? Who's supposed to believe that? That's what happened the first time. Well, what are we supposed to do when our friends are having a hard time and fighting their inner demons? Ubu. Oh, well. North Pole, huh? I'm so hungry that I'm tear bending. Okay, Jerry, looking around. Ice everywhere. <laughs> water, as far as I can see. Oh, the wind is very cold. The boy was so overjoyed at getting to spend another vacation in one of the most beautiful places on Earth. V vacation? That, cheering loudly, he tore off his clothes and jumped into the ice-cold water. Jerry on the rocks! <laughs> Don't ask a 12-year-old to strip, okay? Gotta memorize those fake soccer jokes, yeah. Your attitude. The only thing I care about is art. But you just won't follow the script. Yes, please f f forgive me. I will oh, just try harder. I certainly hope so, you useless amateur. Amateur. Now, farewell. The mighty polar Some whale broke through the ice oh, behind my. Jeremy. And with <laughs> On a his screen. mighty voice, he proclaimed. You have made a brave effort. You even advanced to the edge of the eternal ice. But you cannot withstand the cold. It is time to give up. To let go. Join me as I slide into the dark cold waters under the ice. Ooh. Drowning is, like, one of my worst fears. Like, I, that's one of the ways I really don't want to die. Uh, don't get a cold now, Jerry. Keep your clothes on, you need the warmth. Attempt to put your arms inside your shirt to keep them warm. <laughs> okay, the script is something I can interact with. The magnum opus of the fantastic literary stroke of genius, you ignoramus. The title is... The curse of Zara. Magnum Doofus. A masterpiece of simplicity. Jerry was at the North Pole. It was cold. He was freezing. Just like really being there. It's so authentic. Jerry was snowed in and frozen. Everyone was happy about that. The polar whale sang with joy. <laughs> what a beautiful ending. So 
tragic. Uh, okay, I was waiting to see if they were going to talk some more. If drowning is not how you want to die, how would you want to die? Yeah, Sake's got it right. Peacefully in my bed after a day of good friend company and food. And Spike says, how about no? <laughs> how about no? How about don't die? Uh, yeah. If I had to go in a more, like, violent or upsetting way, I'd just rather not be conscious for it. Basically that. Uh, that suffocation is creepy, or not creepy, is, uh, sorry, this, this is creepy. The eyeballs and everything. Suffocation is awful. Hear my joke answer or my real answer? Uh, yes. Joke first. No, uh, yeah, joke first. Okay, let's look at this stuff. Gigantic candy cane. Jerry couldn't resist. He had to lick it. Just one. Hopefully it's not made of metal. You just want my tongue to freeze. To yeah. Exactly. Oh, I remember that. Finally, you've led the script. Go right ahead. Then. Luckily, never had it very bad. I'm going to save the kids later. Kachunk. Oh, the boy is just too smart for you. Oh yes, sake is a uh, that that would also be very appreciated. No, Quiet. no gore details, please. Christmas tree. Christmas tree. Mum always bakes delicious mince pies for Christmas. The young boys it, it, mince sweets was meat? Overwhelming. It painfully reminded him of the fact that his mother would never again hold him in her arms. <laughs> <laughs> this is just low. The curse and all that is all right, but dragging his mother into this? Disgusting! Yeah. Um, Maybe it'll make me feel better if I take down the decorations. Hmm. Yeah. I Sorry, my brain just kind of shut down. Um. Yeah. Try to keep it PG thirteen, I guess. Uh, and don't go into details. You can be like, and torturous stuff, or just be vague about it, I guess. That would be appreciated. I got too much anxiety, anyways. Uh, okay. Ugh, can't reach it yet. There's no way I'm going to swim through the icy water. The nail? Just cut it out. I know this nail must go. It's evil just like you. But no, save your breath. The nail must go. Now you listen up, mister. Mister. No, the nail must go, and that's that. Woohoo, Jerry! All right. Quiet. Yeah, so in the event of a zombie apocalypse, uh, William, Sake's partner, Wants to wear a suit of armor with a beehive lodged in upon, di upon a dying breath or uh, whatever. So he's boss mode zombie. Yeah, he says, I think he basically said that in the event of a zombie apocalypse, he knows he'd be one of the first to die, so he wants to be a badass boss. <laughs> uh... Okay, Matt says, you know what? Slightly less vulgar version of joke answer. Stand on the tallest tower I can find, grab a wingsuit, wait for a windy day, and have friends throw me as far away as that possible and die with as much adrenaline as I can get in my final moments. Okay. Um. That doesn't seem like a terrible way. Like, as long as you're not gonna land on anybody, basically. Uh. But yeah, um, ocean, ocean, ocean. That is the eye of the polar whale, and he, he looks polar whale. And it's no wonder Jerry posed a sorry sight after all. <laughs> no, it's because of your posters. It, it, it looks like he's watching me. 
Got a candy cane? Got a string of lights. Uh, can I, like, no? How on earth did scientists get the idea this kind of thing would attract whales? Jerry held up the string of lights. <laughs> Man, I'm starving. The polar whale leapt out of the water, burying the boy beneath his gigantic gills. It's a whale. He doesn't have gills. Exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, you want this candy cane whale? How on earth did so Jerry held Okay. <laughs> okay, but I was pretty sure I clicked on the candy cane. How on Huh. And it's no Clicked oh, fast. No, it, 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 and I uh, clicked too fast. Um, okay. Hmm. I'm trying to think of other funny zombie ideas, but the only thing I have is having a handful of small dogs permanently attached to you so you become a zombie dog walker. <laughs> I still have these. Can I see stars? There aren't any stars I can use to orient myself there. Yeah, that would have been surprising. Silver key? Why do I have the silver key? You want this key? It doesn't fit in that screen with an eyeball on it. Um. Okay, well, da, da, da. Advice, rock, green grow, foxes cutting glimmer of hope. Can I grow Nothing. this fake tree? No. Okay, do I need the glimmer of hope? Nothing. Nothing. Nope. Uh, can I mix these two? Oh my god, I can. Looks like I go oh, fishing. Oh. Now I have a very festive fishing rod. I yeah. bet this is how Santa fishes. Wow. So I kind of got it before you said that sake. <laughs> In a weird backwards way. You know, I bet if Santa ever goes ice fishing, he takes along plenty of warm milk and cookies. Right, let's see what happens. Hmm, warm milk and cookies? Hmm, I don't know. The wimpy boy down into the icy depths. Just a cable? Ah, that's an evil... Uh, um, worm. Yes. Ice worm. Yes, that's oh, it. shoot. A wicked electric cable eel that's about to... Uh, just, just, just a moment. This that's is me trying to come up with anything. Neck and zap me with a lethal electric shock. Yes, exactly. Very good. I think you need a vacation mm. if you depend on a 12-year-old to create your heart for you. Maybe, like, warmed honey milk and shortbread. Warmed honey milk sounds really good. Uh, the, like, two times I've had shortbread, I didn't like it, because it tasted like it was mostly butter. But I probably just haven't had any good shortbread. Uh, oh, the cable. The cable loops back there to where all the wind is coming from. Wait, why am I saying back there? when I'm clearly on an ice floe in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> I'll just pull on the cable. Good idea. Oh. Hey, look. It's a wind machine. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, can I fish more? I don't want to fish. I don't want to fish for that. Okay, let's see. That's where all the wind was coming from. Where a butter cookie variant, so that's valid. The difference in air pressure between high and low pressure areas. Guess the teachers in my school must have lied. <sighs> okay. Can I jam a nail in here? Better not. Pish. Uh, can I create a uh, I don't want to put up. parachute? In the case of zombie apocalypse, I would 
85% chance of die from drowning? Oh, because you'd be like trying to get to the ocean and nowhere to go. Uh, this is broken, so that's I'd better be careful with not gonna help. I don't want to fish for that. <laughs> I'm just gonna green grow, rock whisper, advice seeker. Can I like walk over there? No. So that's where I'll, I'll, I thought guests are to <laughs> Do I fish again? Still have it. I'm done with this for now. Oh, I guess not. Do 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 do. Plato, come help me. Nope. Do, 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 do. I need another hint, sake. Ugh, can't reach it yet. There's no way I'm going to swim through the icy water. Can I... It looks a little lost though. Stripped naked and alone in the middle of the ocean. Well, I can't like pick it up and put it down. More because if I don't know what D I J K is. Workers in the Netherlands get zombified. Two thirds of the country would be covered in water. It has to. Oh, right, you brought this up before. It has to be checked and managed on a daily basis throughout the entire year. Maybe they are smart enough to keep managing it and defending it at all costs for the lives of everyone here, but most likely the Netherlands shall drown. Okay. Can I angle the fan to blow? it in the direction of the whale. Can I pull this more? I can. I see. <laughs> I wonder if you posted that before before I said it or not. No, you can't do that. The fan blades would chop up your delicate fingers. Baloney. <laughs> Sorry. Ah. That is much better. Thank you, little night walker. No, no, no! Our nightmare is now <laughs> over. I thought I was stuck. Many are still dwelling under the curse of darkness. You have got to help them. But I'm nothing but a herring. And they're off. Is a mighty whale! <laughs> I'm way too small. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly your strength, little land walker. Woohoo, Jerry! You can do it, Jerry! Quiet! We believe in you, Jerry! Thanks, Hello, Jerry! I shall now dive home. Be strong, Jenny. Be strong. <sighs> I like that you can recognize the voices stop. of the characters in the audience. I will stop him. Curses. Oh. I guess I gotta go walk over there, huh? In a zombie apocalypse, for some places, the danger is not the zombies, but people not defending against nature. Yeah. No. No, no! Yes, You're yes, yes! Everything. You... Jerry removed the nail. Clack. 
He realized that this was all just a dream that he and his friends were trapped in. He understood that he was able to change the dream. But Lucid Dreamer it was his dream. But you can't. The unfriendly man congratulated Jerry. Congratulations, boy. You did it. And was suddenly much nicer than before. That was truly fantastic, Jerry. Boy, this was weird, but you kept on talking. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. The end. Ladies and gentlemen. How every dream ends. The end. Jerry Hazelnut. Encore. And finally, pull a rabbit out of my hat. Oh, I guess not. Jerry woke up. Uh, okay. Mib... Mids... Mib magician. <laughs> Joke ruined. He's trying to do the milady thing because he tipped his hat. No! No! This is impossible! Improbable? <laughs> Poof. Go away. The end. No, not quite. It's a very magician joke. The audience, who oh, uh, uh, are they? Spirits? They're dreamers. The cars brought them here. Oh, why <sighs> That's so liked it. Angry. I've seen this before. They are restless. They are furious. They could forget their way back in their blind rage. Uh, and then? Then they would just become empty spirits haunting the dreams of others. Hitadama. Watch out, Jerry! Oh, I wonder I, I haven't encountered that word before. I presume it's Japanese. It came from over there. Hitodama. You calm down the dreamers. I I'll take care of Zaro. Uh, did he tell He's right. the frog you to do something? Him, can't you? Well, yes, but. <sighs> Uh, nice. Oh, hey. In Japanese folklore, Hitodama are the balls of fire that mainly float in the middle of the night. They are said to be souls of the dead that have separated from their bodies. Yeah, like the souls and soul eater. Soul. Human soul. Cool. Thanks, Sake. So all you gotta do is play a short concert for Restless Souls. Uh, okay. Now where did Zoroff get to? You! You need a hat, man. You defeated the lizards. Removed the nails. The Maquis chose you well. Now, show me what you're made of, Dreamwalker! Dreamwalker. Jerry, defend yourself. Oh, I have a baton all of a sudden. Uh, um, uh, uh. Oh, thank you for casting that <laughs> forever. Oh, oh dear. This doesn't seem to be working. 
guess I've got these nails for no apparent reason. Oh, oh, that's a thing. Uh. A magician is ready to do whatever it takes. Watch out! Oh, whoa! <laughs> that was a super handy way to, uh, to, uh, use the space bar. Did it, did it work? Did it not work? Uh, what? Color equals color. Nail that car lights like above. Is that not what I'm doing? Green, green, green. This nail. It just doesn't seem to be doing anything. Pur purple? Is that this one? Did I bork it? What I'm doing is I select the wand and then I click on this, the magical energy and then Jerry pulls out the wand and then he is like, mm, no. And the coin is how I see the stuff in the background. So how I see what correlates to what. I mean, is it going to do something different if I get it wrong? No. I mean, it's convenient that nothing is happening, apparently. You wanna play quartets, man? No, he doesn't wanna play quartets. You need to pick the spell in your inventory. Oh, so you equip the, the nail with a spell. So purple is the black nail and the purple spell. No? Do I click the the wand first? Maybe not. Okay, purple again. Let's let's wand first. Then spell. No, I changed out of the wand. Oh! Oh what? There's new stuff over here though. Yeah, we're, we're doing something. Okay, blue. So we want to hit it with this one and then hit it with the gold nail, maybe? Can I... Yeah. Uh... Oh, yes! Something's happening! Bam. Excellent. You repelled his spell with a nail and rendered it harmless. Zaroff lost one of his spells. Okay, we got this now. It helps that we kind of couldn't lose. And I think this is the silver nail. Can I double check? Yes. I think you might be having a little bit of trouble um, with frame rates, but it looks well, like nothing is happening for a bit. He repelled his spell with a nail and rendered it harmless. Zaroff has only two spells left now. Uh, 
Okay. Red would be red. And then the... Come on, come on. There we go. Copper nail. A magician's apprentice can learn magic even if it's slow and the opponent was a, is a horrible spellcaster. Go, Jerry. Just go. Go, Jerry. Go. Just two more to go. Excellent. One now left now. Has only one remaining spell. That's the purple one that he tried to do a bunch first. Hi, Clea. Purple. Oh. Waiting, waiting, waiting to, for my cursor to appear. A bunny spirit. It's the marquee in the background. I think in the middle is... Uh, it's probably not going to let me see it now. I think in the middle was Zaroff. And the marquee was on the right. And there was a kid on the left, so maybe me. Koya, what are you doing? You, it is you. Marquis de Hoto. <laughs> his face, Jesus. You did it, Jerry. Zaroff used his magic against you and lost. I didn't mean to do it. Not like this. Marquis! How did you mean to do it? He's still too weak. He cannot answer you. Oh. What a spindly guy. Who, who, who's the boy? Where did he come from? The tree. Where did he go? It remembers. It remembers the teacher and the apprentice who once visited this place. Zaroff did evil things. That's why he cannot look the child he once was in the eye. But who <laughs> among us could, after all? Who is he? What does all this mean? Oh. oh okay. <laughs> Ooh, I thought it crashed for a second. The great Zaroff. One of the greatest illusionists of his time. You may have heard of him. Not many remember him now. In reality, he had three he belts. An illusionist. He was one of us, a magician. Zaroff was the last apprentice of the Marquis de Hoto. When the rabbit trained him, he was just a boy, not much older than you. <laughs> when his training was finished, young Zaroff and his teacher visited the clearing of the first tree, and they left some traces behind. Tree would remember them. Soon, the Marquis and Zaroff became living legends as they hurried from one world to the next, from portal to portal, and help wherever help was needed. And then the Fire Nation attacked. They were true tree wolves. Their path led them to a place where darkness ingrained upon their souls. I was there when the mirror of shadows disclosed to them their own potential. They beheld their own brightest virtues and saw the darkest chasms within their souls. And only few can bear that kind of truth. So it was only a matter of time until the dark seed sprouted within them. And when it did, the Marquis was the first to start doubting the ideals of the tree walkers. Then the apprentice started doubting the teacher. And finally, the two of them turned on each other in hatred. In his blind wrath, the Marquis banished his apprentice to the world from whence he came. He took away his ability to walk between worlds, so that every portal would remain closed to him. Zaroff became a prisoner in his own world. A 
world that had room for magic only on its stages. Thus, he became the Great Zaroff, the Illusionist. But the appeal of the new tricks he invented to captivate his audience soon wore off. And Zaroff fell for a second time. Maroon. What a maroon. In his despair, he began to rattle the doors of his <laughs> Bunny reality. slippers, wow. He turned to alchemy, forbidden experiments, to open up the portal worlds once again. And with every failed experiment grew the hatred for his teacher and for his audience that no longer cared for him. And when Zaroff was finally driven by nothing other than fury and revenge, Something answered to his rattling and knocking. Consortium Squamata. The lizards. The lizards. That's what I said. With There's four three there. Offices, the consortium had already passed through many worlds. Promises that would disturb the balance of nature. Zarov was approached by four members of the consortium. They offered the magician a deal. The lizards had surreptitiously obtained the ability to walk between worlds, but they didn't know the way to the most secret of places. Zarov, on the other hand, had memorized the paths of the tree walkers, the portals, the path to the clearing of the first tree. Thus, he led the lizards through the portals, betraying the tree walker he had once been with every step of the way. In exchange, they gave him the power to cast a curse on one of the first trees. The lizards gave Zaroff four nails. Four nails made of four cursed metals, serving to drive the magician's spell deep oh God, into the huge. of the first tree where it would take effect and make the inhabitants of the portal worlds his final audience. Thus, trying to obtain respect and glory by force. Zarov's final great triumph. Oh, and those are the nails. The worlds were suffering from the curse of Zarov. The lizards invaded them, as they had done many times before. Only one could have provided help. But Zarov's mentor, the Marquis de Hoto, had spiraled himself further into the darkness that the Mirror of Shadows had revealed to him. The Cold One! He was willing to let us freeze to death. The good tree walker who had trained Zarov. I had already given up hope I would ever meet him again. But when Zarov entered the clearing, the first tree remembered the magicians. When it recognized the threat that the apprentice posed, the first tree brought to life and sent out the memory of his teacher. So, the memory of the Marquis de Hoto, shaped long before his own corruption set in, left the clearing of the first tree and promptly forgot that it was nothing but a memory. And once again, he was a true tree walker. He set forth to find himself an apprentice, somebody who would be able to stop Zaroff. He answered your call. The roots of the first tree run deep, even into our dreams. The Marquis found you, Jerry, because you had a dream. Off now. This place might be his only salvation. He will remain in the shadow of the first tree. The Marquis, the first tree, they were right. You went beyond yourself. That's how you finally got to this place and faced down Zaroff. The Marquis made you a true tree walker, but you were forced to pay a high price. When the Marquis went from idea to reality, 
by entering your world, something else had to go. Your father, as though through a revolving door, the Marquis came to life, and your father hmm. was lost in the rift between worlds and forgotten. But do not worry. You saved us all, and very soon we will return the favor. Um, so the old magician there, his... An acquaintance of mine once said, Only those who get on the way can find their way. And so it came to pass that Jerry had to leave his mentor behind in the clearing of the first tree. Jerry knew that he had been more than the memory of a courageous, one-of-a-kind tree walker, more than the first tree of mousewood needing Jerry's help. He had been a friend. Then, for the last time, the Marquis slowly turned and lifted his hand as if to wave goodbye. I, I will never forget you, said Jeremiah Hazelnut. And I, I will never forget you, came the reply from the shadows at the foot of the tree. And the boy knew the Marquis, the tree, he would remember him. Cool. When Jerry returned oh. <laughs> to Mousewood, lost in thought, there was music in the streets. Because for the first time in a long while, an apprentice had come to Mousewood to study the art of arts. And for the first time in a long while, the Treetop Festival, the celebration of friendship and courage, was held in honor of an apprentice who had finished his training. In honor of the Tree Walker. Jeremiah Hazelnut, the rabbit's apprentice. I don't think at the party. I'm holding you, Sake. We'll get through this. Ah! So the, um, this guy's amulet looks like that mirror that showed you the dark truths. And I also wanted to say I really liked the rotating discs, like where they meet in a rotation is where you'd be able to like make a cro make a, a connection to move between worlds. That's a very fun visual. Yep, credits. Uh, let's see. Sake said the marquee is so pretty. Love that bunny boy. Yep. And yeah, during that stuff, Jerry the Adventurous. Eight out of ten would recommend. What's the um, two knocked off for you? Oh, it tells you the names of people. Also, this pine co pine cone fire. Very cute. There is no knocked off. It is a great game. Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> uh. I guess what you could say is the two lacking are because it didn't blow you away as being one of the greatest things ever. I don't know. If I were to rate it, I'd probably give it like a 9 out of 10 with the uh, some of the puzzles being a little too obtuse. Uh... But overall, very good, really good. I um, I love the card game in it. Love the characters. Love the voices. Slightly janky as a um like with some bugs of uh, the speech being in the weird spots or clicking through too fast. But game doesn't have obtuse puzzles. Can you really call it a game? Hmm. Uh, I enjoy it. I have fun. I like 95% of the journey. Had good good voice acting. No... Oh, and animation. It was nice. Yeah, agreed. I'm gonna take a little break from point and clicks, I think. <laughs> Weird Al! Must be on the thanks, beer. Huh. Remember Humbert? I remember. So does anybody have a favorite character? Let's see, favorite character, favorite character. 
one would probably be Plato, even though I call him Pluto a lot. A quorum adventure. I think for what it is, if we are not comparing and just going from effort and fun and detail, 10 out of 10. If I want to be critical, maybe 7 out of 10. I feel like there's a lot, but they could have gone just a little further to make some things a bit more fun or exciting to do. Beyond it having to be do it to do it. And yeah, some of the puzzles are a bit unnecessarily hard. Yeah. Sake likes the Marquis, the Dwarves, and Plato. Uh-huh. I liked Ursula quite a bit as well. I'm gonna just straight up say I love Jerry. I really enjoyed the voice and animation and personality they gave him. He was really a 12-year-old on a magical adventure. I love it. He was a very believable character, which was... Um, I probably underrated that. <laughs> That's not the only reason I like Ursula. Yeah, I think they had fun with Jerry, too. Kids can be hard to approximate. You know, you, you grow up and you forget what it's like. It may be the obvious choice, but that's why he's the obvious choice. He is great. Ursula. Ursula. We should watch that spike. I think we have it on DVD. Uh, Anya, Grumpy Garden Owner. So we have some stories. Yeah, you can come. Uh, have some stories to read. Hi, Kuya. Uh, apparently I can walk around and talk to people. The treetop festival unusually early this year, but... Sometimes it's a really good thing to revive old traditions. This is the most fun I've had in ages. Glad to hear it. I thought he said, instead of they're holding, I thought he said they're hooting, and it didn't make any sense. Uh, me when I'm the only not friend in chat and cannot come to watch cool stuff. Well, today. It's a small group today. And Spike lives with me, so... Oh yeah, I can't see! Uh, da, da, da. We have to have May watch George of the Jungle. She would love it. Yeah. I think she likes coffee, so the Java 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 scene would get her. Nice. Yeah, Spike doesn't count. Even the cats get a spot. This cat that's sitting on my keyboard. Trying to get at my crackers. You are... You're a little brat, Kuya. Ursula? Oh, yeah. This is a great party. Almost makes you forget all your troubles. Oh. Also, Spitzveg is back. Mr. Spitzveg, what are you doing here? Why, my, stop I eating my crackers. They were holding <laughs> the treetop festival earlier this year. So, naturally, I turned right around and came back. You must tell me all about your adventures. And you tell me about yours. Oh, you'll come and see me soon. I brought some lovely kelp tea from mm. the coast. It's like hot seaweed juice. More like cold seaweed juice. It's a grand table. We put it together yesterday in a hurry. Aww. Very stylish, boys. And it yeah, was thank you. fun, too. Yeah, diligent work is fun. You again. <laughs> Not on duty then? No. Penny is now the pro scout. He has to stay away from the cannon now. A few nights ago, he shot <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that was definitely him. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Okay, I can't open my inventory to like use a spell. Can I talk to you? I love the no, I didn't. Festival. I come here every year. I have this magic premonition that you will not be the last apprentice the people of Mousewood acknowledge in this fashion. Hmm, will I become the master sometime? Oh! I was wondering why nothing was happening. Hello. Greetings, Jeremiah. The portals have recovered. You can go home now, Jerry. Are you ready? No, I didn't talk to everybody. Uh, Thank you for giving me the option. Come see us when you're ready. Oh. 
Oh, oh that's nice. Plato, my little cream puff, was really impressed. Ribbit! But we won't know what the folk of Mousewood will think until next weekend. That's when I'll start selling them. Sounds great. Yes, we've been very lucky lately. Sometimes I even dare to hope that old Uli will come back. Oh yeah, Uli. I definitely thought I was going to go on an adventure to find him earlier on. Also, look at how spindly she is. She's like little hairs. Jerry, her legs. I heard you're about to leave us. I hope you'll visit us again soon. Sure, um, I live just around the corner. Well, so to speak. Really? How far is that on a bike? Uh, just a portal away. Oh, well then you'll have to show us your home soon. I hope you like the cupcakes too. Nah, oh, I don't really go for sweet things. They're not good for the teeth, either. Mm. Yummy carrots, on the other hand. Ooh. I'm gorge on those all day. Somehow, I'm not surprised. Then why don't you order a carrot cake from Anya next time around? Is that supposed to be funny? Um... <laughs> he just said he wasn't into sweet things. Also, I have carrots that are very old by now that I was planning to make into carrot cake, so I'll have to see if I can still do that. Where's Junior? Have you seen my son by any chance? Mm -mm. He, he wrote me a letter no. saying he wants to retire to Coconut Palm Islands. Would you believe it? Just as I said. He's a born comedian. I, I bet he's sitting behind some mushroom, thinking up new material for our show. Mm -hmm. Dance at last! Oh, yes! Oh, hey! <laughs> It's amazing how my friend can dance. I wish I could dance like that, but I look the smellier. Okay. Hey, is it true that you saw yeah. the box? Yes, and I befriended it. How We're cool almost there. That? Much cooler than my stupid violin. Well, a talent is not exactly the same thing as a friendship. I don't think they're particularly comparable. Let's talk to uh, uh, Steinberg last. Remember, just because your apprenticeship is finished, that doesn't mean you're a master now. You whippersnapper. Age and experience form the stainless foundation there is. Don't you forget that. And now let's celebrate. Here's to you. <laughs> <laughs> I love this kind of character. Little kooky old guy. Um, here you go, Mats. <laughs> Here's our tree walker now. I hope I can interview you soon. Then you can let us in on how you tamed the lizards, chased off the crows, and defeated the evil magician. Okay, but... No false modesty, please. You've got a good face for the radio. Uh... Also, did I chase off the crows? Are they still going to be a problem because the city is still a problem? Was it, like, my world leaking into their world that was a problem? Here they all go again, drinking oh. our juice. Typical bah. 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 Good taste. Whatever would they do without us wood dwarves, eh? Well, achievement. Okay. Uh I guess it's time to go. Greetings, Jeremiah. The portals have recovered. You can go home now, Jerry. Are you ready? City exploded when the magician who defeated saving the forest and cancelling school permanently. Yay! Yes, I'm ready. And I'm going to come with you. Because I'm your dad! No, I don't think so. My father, my mother, will they be back? They already are. And a dog! And the fox. Terry, we've been waiting for you for an hour. I've had to stop your dad from eating the entire blackberry pie himself. I was hungry. I feel <laughs> like I've been on my legs forever. Me too. Goodbye. Hello, pug. Cutie. And that's all Jeremiah could say. The fox girl still claims that he cried. 
That's so not true. <laughs> thus Jeremiah Hazelnut returned home, and thus ends our story. Oh, hey. But with every ending, other stories begin. <gasps> hey, little guy. They're like waves in the ocean, always in motion, spilling over and intertwining. Some stories tell of huge problems we create for others that can barely be solved, even with courage, especially when you're nothing but a tiny mouse. But perhaps someone is going to step up. Hmm. Night of the Rabbit Part 2. The Mouse Apprentice. And then there are scary tales as well. Secret, forbidden ones that you can only tell behind closed doors. Thank you, Habibal. Are you suddenly cold, too? Who... Who was that boy? <gasps> My friend's apprentice. Thank you for helping me. Beauty. He broke Zarov's curse. I underestimated Zarov. And that boy, too. Will you finally free me from this prison so that I may once again protect the portal worlds? This kind of thing must never happen again. You know that this is impossible, old friend. Uh huh. Ooh, an eye patch. Nothing is impossible. <laughs> real bunny man uh oh you didn't hear that that was glass shattering oh straight back to the menu wow thank you so much uh habibal for the subscription super appreciate you um okay it is three o'clock and we just finished the game but do you guys want to hear the audiobooks for like the next two hours or something? Or can you be satisfied with uh, looking them up on YouTube somewhere else? Matt's wants to. They're long stories. Any other uh, opinions? I guess Sake probably has been exposed to them before and Spike's working. What do you think, Habibal? Story time? As a man who beat Heatstroke, you should expect me to want to listen to this. Habibal is fine either way. Okay, I think... Um... Third story. On wood dwarves. Okay, we did hear that one, but we did Sixth story. No, Grand we did hear that one. Okay, so we have four stories left. Fourth story. Mm. Fifth. Seventh. Eighth. Okay, they have fewer dots here. Fourth story. Oh, he's giving him the rabbit ears. Cute. Uh, Maybe I will let it go and... Let's see if I can do this. See if I can... I can set up my iPad so I can draw along with it. And that way there's a little something more going on. 
Time to listen to audiobooks before bed. <laughs> before bed for you. Mr. Brown and the Curious Case of the Reliable Hedgehog Brothers. It was a dull, windy day when Mr. Brown the mouse arrived. Only rarely did the sun poke through the heavy shroud of grey clouds over Mousewood. It had been days since Mr. Brown left his home town, sleeping at different boarding houses and inns on the way. The further away he got from familiar territory, the more he felt it all becoming a fully-fledged adventure. It was this desire for adventure that had, over the years, driven him to go on long journeys. This time it had been an invitation from his good friend Rushlight that encouraged him to take to the road again. Mr. Brown had met Rushlight on one of his journeys a few years back, and they had been friends ever since. In his letter, Mr. Brown's acquaintance invited him to visit Mousewood. This was where Rushlight had withdrawn to some two months previously, in order to write poetry and read some of his more demanding books in the calm and tranquil ambience that the forest offered. For a hasty observer, it would have been easy to overlook Mr. Brown as he passed through Mousewood. The chubby little mouse had always been an inconspicuous fellow. A skilled observer, however, would have noticed a certain insecurity in Mr. Brown since entering the forest. He seemed to have problems getting around roots, sticks and stones, as these are rarely to be found in towns and cities. So Mr. Brown was preoccupied holding his fedora firmly on his head to stop it falling off, while in his other hand he carried a big case. Despite this challenge, the mouse was actively enjoying roaming around this new territory. Between Mr. Brown's pink ears dwelt a lucid mind, which often proved helpful to his fellow mice, especially when complex tasks or tricky puzzles were involved. Following the directions Rushlight had given him, after turning left at the big birch and then going straight on, Mr. Brown reached his acquaintance's house. From a distance he could already see him in the front garden, sitting in a deck chair reading a book. Rushlight was a mouse of stalwart physique, who wasn't only tall, but also made a tall impression on everyone who didn't match his height. Mr. Brown hardly ever made a tall impression on anyone, at least not through his physique since, even for a mouse, he seemed a little on the short side. Mr. Brown crept up and startled his friend by patting him on the shoulder. Rushlight sprang up from his chair and, recognising his guest, exclaimed loudly, My dear friend! and gave him a literally breathtaking hug. You've made yourself at home, I see, said Mr. Brown, readjusting his hat. Indeed, this really is the place to be, Rushlight said spreading out his arms and taking a deep breath. A couple of weeks in Mousewood will drive the city's grime and noise out of your head, I promise you. Seems like it's done you lots of good already. You almost squashed me, Mr. Brown remarked with a smile. Well, it's a great pleasure to see you again, said Rushlight. Can I offer you a drink? What kind of a guest would I be, his inconspicuous friend replied, if I rejected such an offer? Still very much yourself, I see, said Rushlight with a laugh and offered his friend a seat. Then he disappeared into the house. Mr. Brown sat down and carefully placed his case next to his chair on the forest floor. He relished the moment and looked up, finding the magnificent treetops much more beautiful than the buildings he was used to that filled the city's skies. Moments later, Rushlight returned with glasses and a jug. It's an uncanny coincidence, said Rushlight, and poured Mr. Brown some lemonade. But only yesterday I heard about a case that might interest you. Mr. Brown took a sip of his drink and listened to what his host had to tell him. Over the last couple of weeks I've been taking long walks through the neighbourhood. Roaming the forest after months of dull city life changes you completely. Your spirits, said Rushlight, beating his chest, Return, and you're full of zest. So it was that yesterday I came across a house where a group of animals had gathered. Said house was a beautiful wooden construction, artfully crafted onto a tree trunk. 
As I found out later, the inhabitants had built it themselves. Two hedgehogs, with the reputation of being excellent craftsmen. When you see the house, you'll agree that they deserve all the praise they get. Anyway, to find out what the animals were discussing so passionately, I addressed a beaver standing nearby. He explained that the previous night, the hedgehog brothers who own the house and the workshop behind it had been the victims of burglars. It seems that both their tools and the materials they'd been working with were stolen when they left them in the back garden. Apparently not even a tranquil, idyllic place like this is safe from thieves and their kind, concluded Rushlight. Mr Brown listened attentively, looking into his glass that had now been reduced to one-third full. Maybe you're right, dear friend, he said, but we shouldn't be too hasty to call this theft. Rushlight refilled his glass as a magpie chattered above, spying on them. What makes you think this could be anything other than the work of a common thief? asked Rushlight, intrigued by the thought. Well, according to your account, not only tools but also materials went missing. A thief only after things of certain value would have taken the tools but discarded the cheaper materials. In this respect, I think, local burglars wouldn't differ from their city cousins. You're right, agreed Rushlight but the question remains as to who stole the tools and materials, and for what reason. Determined to solve the mystery, Mr Brown and Rushlight decided to pay the Hedgehog brothers a visit. If this wasn't the work of a common thief, maybe they would find some clue as to the culprit. After finishing the lemonade, Mr Brown put his case inside the house, but took his umbrella, as heavy rain was forecast for Mousewood any time today. The two friends were in luck and the rain held off. The ground, however, was still soaking wet with the rain of recent days. Whenever they encountered miry passages, Rushlight got through without difficulty and Mr Brown appreciated the fact his umbrella could also serve as a walking stick. Accompanied by the scent of earth and moss, the two mice walked along the path. The Hedgehog Brothers' house was located a few paces from the edge of the forest and was indeed a remarkable building. It wasn't enormous, not like a castle, but was of modest proportions, built in several layers and stories around the tree trunk. As the pair was looking at the Hedgehog Brothers' house from the path, a lizard with a slouch hat emerged from the house next door and joined them. You want to visit the hedgehogs? the lizard asked. Yes, indeed, said Mr. Brown. Is that their house over there? It is, and if I'm not mistaken, they've just had visitors. You should probably go over. It certainly looks like rain, the lizard said, pulling his hat a little deeper over his face. Are you acquainted with the Hedgehog Brothers? asked Rushlight, leaning on the fence. Yep, for ages, I might add. They're good neighbours, as everyone will tell you. Both of them are happy to do simple jobs for free and they're reliable. The only thing is, the noise from all the hammering and sawing is unbearable, the lizard said with a rueful smile. Yesterday was the first day in weeks I was able to take a nap in the afternoon. I heard the hedgehog's tools were stolen. That's probably why they couldn't disturb your nap, isn't it? Rushlight asked. That's the case. Yesterday morning they were gone, replied the lizard. Despite the fact that burglary is a very rare occurrence in these parts, you know. The lizard took his leave and went off towards Meadow Pond. Mr Brown scratched his head, while Rushlight opened the gate leading to the hedgehog's home. Just as the visitors were about to knock at the door, it opened. The hedgehog brothers were just taking their leave of guests, a lumpy mole lady and her smaller husband, who both wore thick glasses. Mr. Brown and Rushlight stepped aside to let the moles make their exit. Mr. Rushlight, a pleasure meeting you again, said the corpulent mole lady with a smile. Rushlight, quite the gentleman and a chip off the old block, bowed politely. How do you know my wife? asked the male mole, looking reproachfully at Rushlight through his thick spectacles. Why, Ludwig, 
his wife exclaimed, dismayed. We met this nice gentleman at the garden party near Marigold Meadows. He's from the city. He's here on holiday. The mole helplessly hung his head. Well, I joined you quite late, so it's not surprising you don't remember me. Rushlight tried to help. Please excuse my inadvertence anyway, replied the short-sighted mole, looking at Mr. Brown in a disoriented fashion. The latter was so amused he completely forgot to introduce himself. How can I help? asked one of the hedgehog brothers. We were hoping to discuss the disappearance of your tools with you, said Rushlight in a serious tone. The hedgehog brothers nodded. Every bit of help was much appreciated, since this was already their second day without tools. The second day without work. You heard about that too? asked the mole lady, genuinely upset. Someone took their tools in the middle of the night. They're the most reliable carpenters you'll find. They never forget anything nor leave work undone. And now their tools are gone. And that's not the worst of it. They were working on a new desk for my husband. Ludwig so enjoys writing letters. We'd almost finished the ladies' commission, and suddenly our tools and cuts disappeared, sighed the hedgehog with the red dungarees. His brother in the blue dungarees blew his nose loudly into a large handkerchief. Mr. Brown looked at him with interest. The hedgehog blew his nose again and muttered hoarsely, It's sad that our tools are gone, sure, but I've caught a cold and I've got a temperature. <coughs> he coughed. Then he coughed again. Please let us know as soon as you get your tools back, said the mole lady before saying goodbye. But Lottie, the old desk will do just fine, said her husband as they left the hedgehog's yard, looking up at her insecurely. And I haven't actually written any letters for quite a while. I know, she replied, but just wait till you sit at your new desk. You won't be able to stop writing. The mole sighed quietly. The hedgehog brothers led Mr. Brown and Rushlight around to their workshop behind the house. Everything's just like it was the evening before we were burgled, the hedgehog in the red dungarees said. His brother stood a few paces away, giving his cold his full attention. So you left your tools and the parts for the desk out here when you finished work for the day? Rushlight asked. Yep, said the hedgehog, looking around the workshop. It was empty, save for some sawdust on the grass. Mr. Brown looked up to the sky, his gaze following the shifting clouds. Do you always leave your equipment out in the open like that? he asked. No, usually we put our tools, materials and the like in that store over there. Not because of thieves, but because of the weather, you see. Tools need to be kept dry, the hedgehog explained. Then why would you have left your gear outside in this weather? The short mouse asked, lifting his fedora to scratch his head. The ill hedgehog let out a hacking cough. He forgot. His brother rolled his eyes as if he had already heard the accusation a hundred times. Usually my brother takes care of these things because I'm absent-minded, he admitted. In contrast to me, he's quite reliable, but as you can see, he's ill. As he's got this nasty fever, he went to bed early that evening, and I didn't think of putting our gear in the store. Strange thing, if you think about it. The first time we forget to put our stuff away, someone steals everything. Mr. Brown took a good look around the yard. Tell me, what do you use these other stores for, next to the one where you store your tools? he asked. Jars, the hedgehog replied. We restuck our supply a few months before winter and then locked the shelters. It's a long time since anybody's been in them. Luckily, the thief didn't break in there. Indeed. Seems like a remarkable coincidence, some scoundrel picking precisely that evening to go off with your tools, said Rushlight. Don't forget the materials. What would a thief do with the parts of a half-finished desk? Mr. Brown pointed out. Perhaps we're dealing with an inexperienced thief, the hedgehog suggested. He just grabbed everything he could in a rush. Things rarely get stolen around here, so a lack of experience could explain that, don't you think? But a nervous thief would be in a rush. He'd sooner grab something more valuable than your boards. I'm convinced our thief took the materials on purpose. He must have had some special interest in those desk parts and your work. 
Mr. Brown concluded. The brothers suggested a cup of tea. The ill hedgehog led the way to the living room, staggering slightly from time to time. He seemed a bit dizzy. After going to the kitchen, he returned shortly afterwards and slumped into an armchair. Then he closed his weary eyes, swaying back and forth. You should get some rest, Rushlight said in a worried voice. The hedgehog opened his eyes again, giving him a fatigued blink. I suppose you're right, he said, and then turned to his brother. You heard him. Would you care to put the kettle on? His brother stood up with a smile and went into the kitchen. When Mr. Brown asked about cups, the hedgehog pointed out a cupboard from his armchair. Mr. Brown put four cups and saucers on the table. Then he sat back on the couch, which wasn't all that comfortable, since, for obvious reasons, the hedgehog brothers had no cushions. A few minutes later, the other hedgehog returned from the kitchen. You'd already put some water on to boil, he said to his brother. Had I? he replied. Well, so much the better. The hedgehog poured the tea for his guests and his sick brother, a tasty wild briar tea. Our forest's famous for this, he informed the tourists. If he hadn't been saddened by the loss of his tools, he would probably have added a chuckle. But the brothers found this was no time for joviality. They did nevertheless talk to their guests about the forest, the town and other things. As the ill hedgehog brother reached for his tea and took a careful sip, his brother said, that's my cup. The sick hedgehog took a closer look. Right, he said. Sorry. Mr. Brown smiled. Might I have a look at the key you used to lock up your store? He asked humbly. Puzzled, the hedgehog brothers looked at each other. What could the mouse possibly want their key for? The ill hedgehog pulled the keychain out of his pocket and handed it over to the still smiling Mr. Brown, who examined it closely. Am I right in assuming that these keys fit the locks on the other storerooms? Where your supplies are stored? he asked. Yeah, that's right, the fit hedgehog confirmed. Mr. Brown went to the living room window and looked into the yard where the storeroom stood. I think I may have just solved this puzzling case he said. Rushlight and the hedgehogs were astonished when Mr. Brown suggested going out to the yard. Only the ill hedgehog stayed in the living room and watched them through the open window. This is a good example of how even the trickiest cases can be solved over a nice cup of tea, said Mr. Brown. Up in the trees a few sparrows chirped. Then who is the thief? Rushlight asked impatiently. There is no thief, Mr. Brown answered, and there has been no theft. But our stuff disappeared, the hedgehog said. That is beyond doubt. You're right, of course. So it's time to make it reappear, suggested Mr. Brown, and walked over to one of the stores where the jars for the coming winter were kept. He unlocked the door with one of the keys on the keychain and pulled it open. Between jerky and jarred fruit, lay the half-finished parts of the desk and the tools, in fact, everything missing since yesterday morning. Rushlight was speechless, as was the hedgehog. How did they get in here? he asked in amazement. Your brother did not, in fact, forget to clear up the workshop and your equipment, Mr. Brown explained. After you finished work, he got up again, went to the yard, and, as reliably as always, put the material into the store. But just as he confused the teacups due to his fever, he also confused the stores. His tracks are clearly visible in the mud if you look out of the window, despite the fact that nobody has been there for weeks. When he had finished storing everything, he locked the door again and forgot he'd ever been there, just as he forgot he'd already boiled the water for our tea. That's why he was as puzzled as everyone else about the disappearance of your tools. Things like this happen when you're running a fever, Mr. Brown concluded. Rushlight slapped him on the back and exclaimed, What a reliable fellow. He never forgets anything. Sometimes he just can't remember not forgetting. The hedgehog took a hammer out of the shelter, walked to the workshop, and, hiding the hammer behind his back, waved to his brother. 
So, what's the news? The sick hedgehog at the window asked. His brother produced the hammer. Where'd you find that? His brother asked, in as much amazement as his sore throat and dizziness would allow. The other hedgehog pointed at the store behind him. Right where you put it, brother, he said, laughing. Me? the other brother asked, thinking hard. Really? Well, OK. No one took his mistake amiss. If anything, he had once again proved his reliability. And you can't blame somebody for having a cold, now can you? Later, on their way home, Mr Brown and his friend Rushlight took the time to enjoy the countryside before returning to the forest. Here, on the elevated northern edge of the woods, one could look far into the distance across the fields. The wind hustled big piles of grey clouds through the sky, which, where the sun managed to pierce the thick shroud, cast huge scudding shadows on the fields beneath. Fifth story, Plato's Song Among the reeds of Meadow Pond sat Plato the frog, enduring the midday heat and the constant buzzing of the gnats. The insects had been in high spirits ever since Plato had told them a few hours earlier that he wouldn't be preying on them, at least until evening, when it got cooler. He was accustomed to feeding on fat flies, but didn't mind giving them a day off as long as they left him alone. In this heat, just the thought of shooting his sticky tongue out of his mouth was exhausting. Plato slipped into the water and relaxed. Crawr, he said contentedly, floating just under the surface of Meadow Pond. Just his head poked out of the water, and he watched opalescent dragonflies wheeling and zooming through the clear sky. With their huge compound eyes, the dragonflies could easily spot Plato, even when he was obscured by the water, so they showed off flying aerobatics around him. At least that way they wouldn't tempt him to have a nice little snack. It's moments like these, when you should actually be feeling contented, that you realise there is something amiss. While Plato floated like a piece of wood, motionlessly pondering until he bumped into a water lily, his thoughts wandered to music. A long time ago, he had made music with four friends, by the pond or in glades, playing sessions which had brought them a certain amount of fame and recognition. Besides Plato the Frog, the band consisted of Jonas, an otter from the north and a gifted trumpeter, Nicholas the lizard, an inspiring triangle player, Peter the badger, a master of the harmonica, and last but not least, Anya the mouse, who sang and played the accordion. Their ways had parted long ago after a heated argument, although today nobody could remember what it had been about. At the time, everyone went their separate ways, and hadn't played together since. But even today, some forest dwellers remembered the small group of musicians and their sessions. Plato climbed out of the water and sat down cross-legged on top of a lily pad. He wanted to make music again. So why not pay his friends a visit this afternoon to maybe have a jam and relive the good old days? As this thought struck him, Plato sprang up danced a couple of tap steps, spread out his arms and exclaimed loudly, Quack! It already sounded like part of a song. In a high arc, the frog leapt headfirst into the water and swam back to his house on the opposite bank. A small footbridge led to the water where a rowing boat was moored. Frogs, of course, do not generally need boats, but Plato always had one ready for those guests who weren't too keen on swimming and could thus still enjoy the idyll of Meadow Pond with him. Plato opened his front door, walked down the hall and climbed the ladder leading to his bedroom. His home clearly marked him out as a music enthusiast. His walls were covered in posters of famous musicians who'd been at their peak decades ago and since fallen into obscurity. 
Great entertainers from a time when the streets of the big city were filled with infectious rhythms and catchy tunes. Crab Calloway, the singing crustacean, a remarkable band leader in a white suit. The Rat Pack, who were in fact three very successful mice and who cracked jokes together on stage while performing their most enjoyable songs. There was a picture of Maurice Skunk, a charming French singer. Plato even owned a record player and a collection of LPs with his favourite singers. Despite the fact it was still very warm outside, the frog put on a white shirt, black trousers and braces, as he always did when going out to visit friends or family. Even in weather like this, for Plato it was out of the question not to dress in style. Finally, Plato went to the living room and opened the big doors of a huge cupboard. Carefully, he took out a case, put it on the table and unlocked it. The case contained Plato's violin, its polished red wood gleaming in the sunlight. He ran his hand over the precious instrument before closing the case and snapping the locks shut. Then the frog left to visit the friends he had lost sight of so long ago. As Plato didn't like walking along gritty paths with his thin-skinned feet, which were more suited to swimming and the living room, he decided to take his bike. He strapped his violin case onto the rack and started pedalling. First on the list to visit was Peter. As far as Plato knew, the badger now owned a bakery and sold pastries on the western outskirts of the forest. The quality of his bread was beyond question, with many customers happily confirming the fact every Sunday when he baked his famous Sunday rolls. Plato rode along the bank of the pond, then turned onto the track that led around Mousewood. The direct route through the forest was shorter, but by bike he'd be quicker if he rode outside the woods. En route, he came across two humans, who watched the frog pass by with astonishment. Look, a frog, said one to the other. They live in ponds and pools and eat insects, I think. Soon the frog reached the western edge of Mousewood where he got off and pushed his bike along the path, since he wasn't familiar with this part of the woods and didn't know exactly where to find his old friend. In front of a row of houses, two grandfatherly squirrels were telling stories of the old days, with a cluster of grand and great-grandchildren playing and laughing around them. When they saw the frog with his bicycle, the children stopped playing to get a closer look at the stranger. The seniors, however, were too busy talking to take any notice. Plato turned to them and cleared his throat. Grandpa, I think the frog wants something, one of the kids shouted, staring at his grandfather and pointing at the frog. As he couldn't stare at Plato at the same time, the other children took that part. Uh, yes, what is it? one of the elderly squirrels asked. Uh, excuse me, Plato began. Could you tell me where I can find the local bakery? Bakery, hmm, the elderly squirrel mused. Used to be right over there, he said, pointing to the left with his cane. Then, he continued, then it moved over there, and he pointed to the right. Nowadays, though, he concluded, putting his cane back on the ground in front of him, nowadays they're somewhere else. You'll find bread and pastries, over there. Plato turned around. There indeed, with a shop window displaying the finest cakes and rolls, was the bakery. It was full of customers. Many thanks, Plato said, and pushed his bike over the road. That frog's got style, said one of the elderly squirrels to the other. Plato's braces obviously recalled his own youth when the streets of the big city were filled with infectious rhythms and catchy tunes. He reminds me of someone. The bakery was bustling with activity. The entrance or exit of every customer was faithfully marked by a tiny bell and made no exception for our frog. Inside, the smell of freshly baked wares filled the air. Cakes and bread, but also rolls and cookies. Behind the counter, a badger attended to customer after customer. Plato wasn't sure how he should ask about Peter, 
and decided to join the short queue. A few minutes passed, accompanied by the bell's clear ring when the door opened or closed and the sale of blueberry cake, cheese sandwiches and coarse wholemeal and poppy seed bread. Eventually it was Plato's turn, and since he wasn't an ordinary customer, he tried not to confuse the baker too much. Um, I am an old acquaintance of Peter's. I hope this is the right place to look for him, he said. It certainly is. The badger lady replied, I'm his sister. I'm just helping out. He's moving in with his wife, you know. That's why he's not here right now. I see, said Plato thoughtfully. Unfortunately, I can't reach him at the moment either. Um, would you like to leave a message? The badger lady asked helpfully. Just send him my best wishes, please. Best wishes from Plato the frog. I'd like to make music with him again. Plato? I've heard of you. He'll be happy to see you again, she said. Here, have a few of our fresh cookies. On the house, she added with a twinkle. Thanks, said Plato. I'm sure they're delicious. An elderly mouse behind him elbowed her way to the front of the queue and said, Yes, we all think they're delicious. So it would be most kind if you would let the rest of us buy some as well. Plato was tempted to complain about the mouse's rude manner, but then remembered he wasn't an ordinary customer. So he left the shop, and the soft ring of the bell bade him farewell. The frog picked up his bike, brooding. There were still three music acquaintances from the old days left to visit. Anya the mouse, Nicholas the lizard, and Jonas the otter. Plato strapped the cookies on the rack of his bike next to his violin case and rode off. He seems somehow familiar, said the elderly squirrel with a cane as he watched the frog disappear. You're probably confusing him, old chap, his equally elderly friend replied. And if I am, then it's my business, said the other squirrel. He swung his cane through the air, pointed it towards the bakery, and shuffled surprisingly quickly across the road. Entering the shop, the squirrel had a look round. When he saw the badger lady behind the counter, he elbowed his way to the front, ignoring the numerous cries of, How dare you! Intolerable! What appalling manners! He wasn't that bothered. A squirrel of his age can do pretty well as he pleases. Excuse me, but who was that sprucely dressed frog who was here a minute ago? the old fellow asked the badger. That was Plato, the musician, she replied. Plato, of course, the squirrel exclaimed, smacking his paw against his forehead, angry that this hadn't occurred to him earlier. Behind the still irritated customers, yet another person shoved their way through to the front. This time it was Peter the baker, carrying a large box and wheezing, Plato the frog? Plato let the cool breeze play around his green head as he rode past fields and meadows and a group of mice and squirrels on a hiking trip. Eventually he reached an avenue of old trees offering much needed shade. The frog dismounted and had a look round. Jonas the otter lived near the avenue close to a small stream, so Plato left his bike at the track and walked down a narrow path leading to his friend's house. There he knocked on the front door. No one answered. There was no one home. Disappointed by his run of bad luck, Plato strolled back up to the avenue and decided to take a break from his roaming around. At that moment a gentle melody wafted down to him. It was a robin, high in the treetops, and its song was so lovely Plato stopped to listen. A few minutes later, the robin had finished and took off from the green canopy into the clear blue sky. But Plato was oblivious, having fallen asleep. While he was sleeping, Plato's dreams took him far, far away, as far as one can be taken by one's dreams. Yet, for a moment, he thought he heard two old squirrels, a badger and other animals, walking through the forest, chatting. But so many dreamlike things happened in his dreams that the voices almost immediately slipped away again and sleep had him back in its cosy arms 
at the edge of the forest. When Plato awoke, the sun had almost disappeared beyond the horizon, taking the warmth of the day with it and leaving sky and clouds to shine in the afterglow. Back on his feet, the frog took a few moments to grasp where he actually was. I must have fallen asleep, he thought. No wonder in this heat. Now, though, he was wide awake and well rested, and it was a really lovely evening. But now he could hardly visit his acquaintances, being reluctant to disturb people after sunset, and even more so uninvited. So Plato made his way back to Meadow Pond, without having jammed with a single one of his friends. He sighed and reached for the cookie bag strapped to his bike rack. He took a cookie. And then another. Delicious, he thought, eating some more. When the bag was empty, he crumpled it up, put it in his pocket and brushed the crumbs off his shirt. Then he switched on his bike lights and rode home. Night had not yet fallen when Plato reached Meadow Pond, but it was dusky enough to spot the fireflies as they sped through the reeds and tall grass in front of his house. Wanting to walk the rest of the way, Plato got off his bike, when suddenly someone leapt out of the bushes. The frog! It's the frog! shouted the little squirrel, pointing at Plato and scurrying off towards Meadow Pond. Plato was quite startled. Slowly he pushed his bike onwards, the sand crunching beneath its wheels. We wondered when you'd turn up, shouted Peter the Badger, waving to him. With him were Anya, Nicholas and Jonas, all the musicians he used to play with so many years ago. There were also the grandfather squirrels, their grandchildren and several other forest dwellers. They had decorated the footbridge to Plato's house with lanterns and all of them were in a merry mood. The elderly squirrel he had talked to outside the bakery came up and said, I always admired your music, you know. When I heard you wanted to play again, I gathered your former colleagues together and then waited for you right here. It seems you have quite a few fans, he said, pointing out the guests who raised their glasses of blue juice in greeting. Some of them Plato recognised as customers of the bakery. Well then, said the frog, opening his case and taking out the instrument. The guests held their breath in anticipation. They were so quiet they could hear the soft sound of Plato picking up his violin and bow. Plato walked down to the footbridge where his fellow musicians were already assembled. All four greeted Plato as if it had been yesterday when they last made music together. And then they were set. Anya the mouse picked up her accordion, Nicholas the lizard had his triangle at the ready, a bit nervous about playing in front of an audience again, Jonas the otter fiddled with the mouthpiece of his trumpet, calm as could be, and Peter took his harmonica out of his front pocket. Why don't we start with Plato's song? Anya suggested. The other musicians agreed, and Plato felt honoured, since he had composed Plato's song, one of their most famous pieces, back in their heyday. The band started to play, and their music sounded just like in the old days. The audience were enthusiastic, and more and more animals from the neighbourhood came to listen to the infectious rhythms. Even the toad family swam over from the opposite side of Meadow Pond and joined in. As the song ended, the frog danced a couple of tap steps on the footbridge where the boat for guests had been tied up, spread his arms wide, and, to applause from the audience, said loudly, Quack! And that's how Plato's song ends. Sixth story. Granny Mouse. We already listened to this one, so we're skipping this one. Seventh story. When the animals wanted to drive a stranger out of their woods, but found a friend instead. Spitzweg the Marmot was a wanderer. His current journey was coming to an end, since just a few steps separated him from home. Just a few steps till he set foot in his beloved mousewood again. Spitzweg had travelled far. He had seen the sea and the mountains. He had rafted rivers,
taken trains and met many animals, even making friends in places where people welcomed him in foreign languages. All this just proved him right, he thought to himself. A friendly fellow is welcome everywhere. Marmots, by the way, are small animals which are similar to mice or squirrels, but which are, in fact, marmots. Spitzweg turned to the dirt track he'd walked as a kid on the way to school. Today, the track seemed so much narrower. The marmot was looking forward to putting his rucksack down and his feet up when he got home. But he was not quite there yet. Suddenly, the ground beneath Spitzweg began to shake. At first, the wanderer thought it was an earthquake, as he had experienced on his travels. Then he remembered there were no earthquakes in Mousewood. If the earth shook here, there was only one explanation. And indeed, suddenly about twenty wild boar crashed out of the dense undergrowth and stampeded past him, blazing a trail through the forest. At first glance, it looked as though they did so recklessly, flattening everything in their path. A keener observer, however, could see they were extraordinarily careful and had a keen eye for their surroundings, even though they were en route to their favourite wallow. This became clear when one of the hogs noticed Spitzweg. He broke away from his fellow boars, ran a curve, and approached the wayfaring marmot at hog's speed. Are my eyes playing tricks on me again? he grunted loudly. No big fella they aren't, Spitzweg said to the tusker. Spitzweg, he called and squealed so loudly one would have been forgiven for trembling in fear. Welcome home. This was music to Spitzweg's ears. Coming home always feels good, but it feels even better if someone welcomes you, especially if it's a good friend like Fiddler the Boar. Fiddler was of impressive size. So impressive, in fact, that no one dared take his chances with this hulk of a hog. As a piglet, he had often been mocked, without the other children needing a particular reason. He was just a piglet, a pushover. But Spitzweg had looked after Fiddler, and so they had long been good friends. How are you? How was your journey? asked the boar. Good, replied Spitzweg. So many stories to tell. But I'm heading home first. Sleep is the reward for staying up all day, and I think I'm going to collect my share. You should get some rest then, Fiddler grunted. Good to have you back. It's good to be back, said the marmot, amicably patting the boar's bristles and raising some dust. They walked some way down the path when a sudden noise startled them, a human noise. Spitzweg and his friends hid in the bushes at the wayside. Humans tend to get nervous if they come across wild hogs or marmots, and you never know what a nervous human will get up to. So animals prefer to keep some distance between them and humans, as at least the rarer specimens inevitably make humans extra nervous. The human roaming nearby, however, didn't seem one of the nervous kind. He was trying to whistle a tune. It wasn't quite clear what song it was supposed to be, Whistling obviously wasn't one of his strong points. The young man looked to the left and right as he passed the bushes where Spitzweg and Fiddler were hiding. Reminds me of my brother, Fiddler whispered. The hog didn't say this because of a physical resemblance, but because his whistling sounded very much like Fiddler's brother. Suddenly, out of the blue, a chestnut hit the young man on the back of the head. Hey, he said, looking around. But, since there was no one to be seen, he thought the chestnut had just fallen from one of the trees. He didn't realise there were only beech trees growing around him, and very rarely do chestnuts drop from beech trees. Then, just as the young man wanted to stroll on, the beeches seemed eager to make some more exceptions. Pock, pock, pock! A volley of chestnuts and acorns hit him on the back and head. That started to make the human nervous. He tried to duck and dodge, but, clumsy as humans are, he staggered, fell full length on the ground, and later out for the count. Pock! Another acorn hit him on the head. Give him a break, I think he's had enough! Someone shouted from above. 
As the human was no longer something to be feared, and they wanted to know what was going on, Spitzweg and Fiddler left their hiding place. Three young weasels climbed down the trunk of a beech tree and cautiously approached the unconscious man. All three had shoulder bags packed with chestnuts. From behind a nearby tree, Humbert the mouse also came out of hiding, his sister Tina clinging to his hand. His mother had once again made him babysit his little sister. He wasn't too keen on that as he then had to take her into account when planning his adventures. What are you up to, boys? Spitzweg asked the weasels. Who wants to know? The tallest of the weasel boys asked. My friend and I do, Fiddler grunted, growling and clawing the ground. This made an impression on the weasels. It even made them flinch. Little Humbert, however, seemed not so easily impressed. He faced Fiddler at the marmot. His sister wanted to befriend the brawny boar and tried to go over to him, but her brother kept a tight grip on her hand. We just wanted to chase away that human, Humbert explained. I see, Spitzweg said with arms folded. He didn't get very far, did he? He approached the human and put his hands on the man's body. He felt his chest rise and fall. He seemed all right, considering he'd been scared unconscious. He'd be back on his feet soon enough. Humans don't belong in our woods, said one of the weasels. Spitzweg looked at him blankly. Humans don't belong here? he asked. You know what humans are like, replied the weasel. They trample through our forest, disturbing the peace, said another weasel. The third weasel nodded frantically in approval and said, Right, they disturb the peace. They come here and think they can do as they please, the first weasel added. We must put a stop to it. We must finally put a stop to it. A stop to it, said Humbert's little sister, smiling brightly at her new friend, Fiddler. Proud she had repeated the sentence so well, even though she didn't actually know what it meant. What exactly did that human do to you? Did he whistle too loudly? Spitzweg asked, as he couldn't stand it when someone was harassed, especially if they hadn't done anything wrong. Even if that someone was a roughly six-foot-tall human who stumbled over his own feet and couldn't whistle properly. Well, he hadn't done anything yet, admitted one of the weasels. Maybe not, the second weasel intervened, but only because we didn't give him the chance. Five minutes later, he might have stomped through somebody's garden or grabbed your neighbour because he needed a warm hat for winter. Right, the third weasel confirmed. A hat. I've heard of humans doing such things, Humbert said all knowingly. You know how humans are. Humans leave their litter wherever they go. They pick flowers and gather mushrooms from our clearings. And then they go home again. Right, said all three weasels simultaneously. So you think all humans are like that? asked Spitzweg. Of course, it's always the same with them. I dare you to say otherwise, said one of the weasels belligerently. You're a cheeky chappy, aren't you? growled Fiddler, looking fiercely at the weasel. I'm sorry, the weasel whispered meekly. Tina giggled as she found his fierce face quite amusing. You know, I've been to many places during the last couple of years. Up in the north, I was even attacked by an albino penguin. Believe me, it's not always the same with humans, said Spitzweg, pointing at the young man lying on the ground. If you think all humans are alike, you might as well say all mice are alike. He looked at Humbert. Well, we may look similar, the young mouse admitted, but we're not all alike. My Uncle Henry, for example, he's different. He's a gardener and he talks to his ivy. There you are, said the marmot. There certainly are humans who are gardeners, just like your uncle is. Some humans may on occasion disturb the peace and misbehave. But if somebody strolls through the forest whistling, that's no reason to chase him away. Whistling is not a crime. Robins whistle too, Humbert admitted. My brother whistles, Fiddler remembered. The wind whistles when it blows through the hole in my wall, one of the weasels said. The other two looked at him inquisitively. Really, just like someone who was whistling, explained the weasel. Whistling or not, yelled one of the other weasels, you can't compare humans to animals. 
They don't belong in the forest. They should stay where they belong. They should just leave us alone. You want the humans to leave us alone? asked the marmot. If the humans knew you were throwing chestnuts at ramblers, you can imagine it wouldn't be peaceful here for very long. We don't like getting hit by chestnuts either, do we, boys? added Fiddle of the Boar. Humans aren't all the same, apart from the fact they don't like being hit by chestnuts. And in that, they're no different from us animals, Spitzweg said, and faced the young man. Just look at him. Doesn't he look peaceful? The animals fell silent. They listened to the humans breathing. Humans even benefit the forest, Spitzweg said calmly. They wander our woods and collect acorns, beech nuts and chestnuts. And when they dispose of the seeds, maybe a new tree grows there. A new forest could even grow in another place. Humbert, who was easily persuaded by scientific explanations, approved. Sounds reasonable, he said. As long as they don't do anything unfriendly, we can consider them our friends, Spitzweg concluded. The weasels liked the idea of having a giant as a friend, so they had a pretty bad conscience for treating the man so harshly, even though they would never have admitted it. They put down their chestnut-filled shoulder bags. One of them cautiously walked over to the unconscious human and put a chestnut into one of his jacket pockets, as a sign of friendship, and in the hope that the human would throw it away where the humans lived where there weren't so many lovely trees as in Mousewood. The human started mumbling and sighing in his sleep. The animals couldn't quite get what he was saying, but it sounded something like, where's the deck of cards? The weasels looked at Spitzweg as they believed he knew what the human was talking about. But the marmot just shrugged. Humbert's little sister let go of her brother's hand and ran over to the slumbering visitor. Tired? she asked, and touched the huge human's nose with her small paw. That seemed to tickle the unconscious man. He suddenly started moving. Humbert took his sister's hand, and the animals swiftly retreated to the bushes at the roadside. From there they watched the man regain consciousness. He smacked his lips, scratched his nose, and opened his eyes. Look, he's awake. Can you see him looking around? Spitzweg asked the youngsters. Yes, said Humbert, watching excitedly, as the human first supported himself with his hands and then struggled to his feet and stretched to full size again. What imposing creatures those humans were. Of course you had to be careful with them since they could possibly become erratic, but watching a wild human was truly a unique experience. The young man got up and dusted himself down. He wondered what had happened and why he'd woken up on the ground. Finally, he accepted the idea he had tripped over, the thought that clearly embarrassed him. He looked around to make sure no one had witnessed his misfortune. But there were no humans or animals to be seen. So he relaxed and started whistling again. Just as he was about to walk on, he discovered something in his pocket. Look, he's found my chestnut, one of the weasels said. And he's looking at it very closely. He seems to like it, doesn't he? One of the other weasels commented. The human turned the chestnut over in his palm and obviously found it a lovely chestnut. He put it back in his pocket and took it along with him. Then the animal's new friend wandered off down the forest track, whistling. The animals watched him disappear, and little Tina waved to him. Goodbye, she said. How come you know so much about humans? one of the weasels asked Spitzweg. I've learned many things about them on my journeys, he answered. But I've also seen a lot of animals that would seem strange to most people in Mousewood. Have you seen a tapir? one of the weasels wanted to know. Indeed, I saw one in a park in the city. Spitzweg replied. They've got stripes, haven't they? Another weasel inquired. The tapir I met didn't have any stripes, Spitzweg said. I always thought tapirs had stripes, at least two or three on their backs, the weasel said, pondering. There may be tapirs with stripes, 
It's possible, the wayfaring marmot admitted. I had stripes when I was little, Fiddler the Boar said. Uncle Henry has stripes too, added Humbert. Then he bade the others goodbye as he had to take his little sister home. It was already past noon and both had to be back for lunch. Little Tina said goodbye to the large boar and walked off with her brother. A few quick goodbyes later, the weasels left as well. All three of them were still a bit upset, having been taught a lesson by the marmot and his brawny friend. But in the end, the marmot was right. Sleep is the reward for staying up all day, and I think I'm going to collect my share, Spitzweg said again to his friend the boar. Then go and get your well-earned rest, grunted his tusky friend. They walked to the marmot's home near Buttercup Meadows and agreed to meet later that evening and enjoy some pints of blue juice. Because blue juice was unique to Mousewood. Spitzweg unlocked the door and stepped into his shady house, the home he had been so far away from for so long. Finally, the marmot could leave his heavy rucksack on the floor and fall onto his cosy couch. The young man, meanwhile, had reached his family's house and was about to let himself in. Then he remembered the chestnut in his pocket. The human looked at the shiny red-brown chestnut from Mousewood. Not knowing what else to do with it, he tossed it into one of the flower beds in the garden. Maybe he had a hunch that that was just the right place for it. Eighth story. Last but not least, a wizard proven right, and a badger finishes his work. Ludwig Mole sat at his new desk, looking through his thick spectacles at the letter he had written so very carefully. He'd reread the lines several times now, just as carefully as he had written them, to make sure he hadn't misspelt anything. The Mole was no seasoned writer. Back in the old days, he had occasionally written his wife long letters. That was many years ago, but his wife still saw the bold writer of days long gone in him, so she took every opportunity to remind her husband of his talents. She had a soft spot for talented animals. That's why she was also the head of the Mousewood Art Society organising exhibitions and readings every second Thursday, featuring paintings and poems by Mousewood's resident artists. If there was an exhibition or reading scheduled, letters had to be sent to all members of the society, and Ludwig had to write those letters. Admittedly, his new desk did make the work actually more convenient. This letter, however, was especially important. Ludwig got up from his chair, took the letter and walked over to the massive wooden door leading from his study to the hallway. If he had employed a secretary, this is where she would have sat, typing on her typewriter. But Ludwig didn't have a secretary. What he did have, however, was a kind neighbour who helped him write the letters. Nicholas the lizard sat in the hallway, his slouch hat in his hands. As Ludwig entered, Nicholas rose, straightening his jacket. Good day, Nicholas said. Uh, my wife asked you to assist me, didn't she? Ludwig asked, squinting because the lizard was too slim to be seen properly by a mole. She certainly did. Jolly good. Well, here's the text, Ludwig said, offering the sheet of paper to the hat stand, which did have a slight resemblance to Nicholas. The lizard shuffled over to the mole, took the sheet from his hands and looked at it. Then Mrs. Mole came in, happy to find Nicholas and her Ludwig getting along. She liked companionable animals. Ludwig, have you written the letter? she asked. She saw the sheet of paper and yanked it out of the lizard's hands, since she was in a hurry. Splendid, Ludwig, she called out, skimming through the text before giving Nicholas the letter back. Then she pushed both men through the door into the study and said, now the two of you copy this text till we have enough letters, one for every resident of Mousewood. Hurry up and please, in your best handwriting. Then she closed the door. The lizard and the mole started to write the invitations. 
Two days later, a postman came by to pick up the letters and take them to the post office. As a tired Nicholas and an overwrought Ludwig handed him the bundle, he could have sworn both of them had been close friends for years and years. In fact, it had only been two days. The following Thursday, the beaver, head of the post office beside the stream, was sorting parcels by address and addressee at his huge sorting desk. The water wheel clattered as the rivulet made its babbling way downstream, when suddenly the post office door opened and the wizard entered. As he crossed the old wooden floor, one couldn't be sure if it was the wood or the old man's bones that were creaking. As usual, the wizard had come to bother the beaver with the same question he'd been asking for weeks. The old man cleared his throat. <coughs> Excuse me, Master Beaver, but is there any post for me? He asked politely. The beaver stared at the wizard in disbelief. For an instant he thought it was just the wizard's strange sense of humour. Then he considered the possibility that the wizard himself could have gone a bit strange due to his incredible age. He looked into the wizard's eyes, wondering how old he might be. Master Beaver? the wizard said, not sure if he had already asked for his post or not. Not because he was old and forgetful, but because the beaver hadn't responded. As I've already told you, we deliver posts directly to your home, and nothing has been forgotten, the beaver reassured him, and if he'd been taller, he might even have patted the old man on the back to comfort him. There is definitely post for me, the wizard said with conviction. Haven't we discussed this already? asked the beaver. Since it was too complicated to explain why he hadn't actually been mistaken, not even the first time, the wizard didn't waste time explaining. But he didn't give in, either. Listen. All the residents of Mousewood have had post in recent days. Each and every one. Only my letter seems to be missing, said the wizard. I delivered my own post just yesterday, the beaver said, but I haven't had time to read it yet. You should maybe check your post box thoroughly. You may find your letter. Slowly but surely, the wizard was getting impatient. He had already checked his own post box to such a degree he was worried he had overdone it. So the bearded man opened the wooden case he carried on his shoulder and took out his magic wand. In fact, a real wizard doesn't need a wand to cast spells, but by using his wand he could demonstrate to the beaver there was magic involved. Silence and focus were now essential. The wizard waved his wand. Magic sparks zapped through the air, glistening in iridescent colours. The wizard then murmured magic words in a language long forgotten. Roughly translated, it meant, Watch out! There is magic about to happen, and you never know with magic, so don't complain or anything. Then he pointed the wand into the room, and a short burst of lightning shot out of the tip, and with a sizzle hit the cupboard on the wall by the sorting desk. This literally breathed life into the cupboard, and it started to lumber towards the wizard and the beaver on short wooden legs. The wizard seemed even more startled than the beaver. Luckily, the march of the furniture came to a halt a moment later. By the wall, where the massive cupboard had until that moment stood, lay a letter on the floor. It must have fallen off the desk. The beaver picked up the envelope and read the address. To the wizard, Mousewood. The old man opened the envelope and skimmed the contents. Dear friends and neighbours, the Mousewood Art Society is happy to invite you to a very special occasion. Next Thursday, one of Mousewood's great artists will exhibit his paintings to the public for the first time. These works, created over recent years, depict the forest and its residents in the most diverse situations and circumstances. You may even discover yourself in the paintings of this extraordinary artist, and you will certainly see the forest from a new perspective. We look forward to welcoming you next Thursday at Marigold Meadows. Best wishes, the Mousewood Art Society.
the wizard gave the letter back to the beaver. The latter pondered a while, since he wasn't sure if he was allowed to read it. After all, it wasn't addressed to him. Deep down, of course, the beaver knew one shouldn't read foreign post. But since this letter was addressed to all residents of Mousewood, and his own letter waited unread at home, and it was okay with the wizard, he read it anyway. Nice today, isn't it? said the beaver. Right now, to be precise, replied the wizard. Can we make it in time? asked the beaver. The wizard's eyes flashed. They flashed with the same magic that had moved the cupboard, and was now, with a bit of luck and focus, to get them to Marigold Meadows in time. We can, the wizard said confidently. The beaver and the wizard left the post office, and after the beaver had locked the door, the wizard lifted him onto his shoulders. Then the old man focused intensely, channeling magic powers. He hadn't done that in quite a while, so he wasn't sure if it would work. But then it happened. The wizard was no longer standing on solid ground, but instead floating a good five inches above it. The beaver hung on tight to the wizard's collar as the old man accelerated, going faster and faster until he was racing at high speed along the dusty tracks leading to Mousewood, with the beaver still clinging to his shoulder. It was quite a sight. The wizard stood upright and unmoving, yet gliding fast, raising clouds of dust behind him as his white beard fluttered in the wind. As the wizard and the beaver headed towards Mousewood, they flew over a small animal with a bushy auburn tail and beady black eyes as it popped out of the bushes. It was Edward the squirrel. Edward had gone missing a few days previously during a practice session of popping out from behind something. The squirrel had used the time to think about his life, acorns and nuts. Seeing him, the wizard broke his stride, swaying in mid-air like a boy in a choppy sea. Edward, what are you still doing here? The beaver asked the squirrel from the wizard's shoulder. Why, hello, Edward said. Have I missed something? We're in a hurry, the wizard said, and you are invited. As he spoke, the old man tapped the wooden case strapped to his right side with his left hand. Edward needed no further explanation. Swiftly he climbed up the wizard's leg, leapt onto the wooden case and held tight to the leather straps. The wizard went back a few paces and then took off over the forest track again at high speed. I don't think this is going to work, shouted Rushlight. He was en route with his old friend Mr Brown on a cart borrowed from the badgers. Rushlight was pedalling the bicycle, propelling the cart as hard as he could, but it wasn't moving. We're running late, Mr Brown called out, sitting back on the cart, holding on to his fedora. We should probably call for help. There's no one around for miles, Rushlight said, exhausted. Then we've got to call some attention to ourselves, Mr Brown said, and yelled, Hello? Anybody out there? There was no answer, but suddenly a strong wind blew up, taking Mr Brown's hat along in the process and leaving it somewhere up in the branches. The chubby mouse wistfully watched his headpiece disappear. My apologies, the wind said from some distance away. Then it turned and approached the mice in a wide curve. As it got closer, it took on the shape of an elderly wizard. An elderly wizard floating along with a beaver on his shoulder and a squirrel at his side. At this sight, Mr Brown put his paw to the spot where his hat had just been. The wizard looked up and hovered straight to the treetops, slowly spinning. He collected Mr Brown's fedora from between the branches and then descended slowly to the ground. Here you are, the wizard said, handing Mr Brown his hat. Much appreciated, Mr Brown replied. Are you going to the exhibition? he asked, pointing at the wizard's case. One corner of the envelope was poking out, enough to give Mr Brown a clue as to where they were heading. Indeed we are. You, however, seem to be suffering some difficulties and are now worried you may be late, I assume, the wizard said, pointing to the cart stuck in the muddy forest earth. Stuck deep enough to tell the wizard Mr Brown and Rushlight needed help. Unlike Mr Brown, the wizard usually needed more than just one clue to solve problems the classical way. 
in other words, without magic. In this case, though, he was right first time. Your assumption is correct, Mr. Brown answered. Well, you're welcome to travel with us, the wizard offered. We still have some room. He lifted Mr. Brown onto his right shoulder and helped Rushlight to climb up the wooden case. The brawny mouse greeted Edward with a firm handshake. Name's Rushlight, he said. Good day, replied Edward. The wizard accelerated again, and together with the post office beaver, Edward, Mr. Brown and Rushlight, he floated on to Marigold Meadows. There are so many animals in Mousewood that a mighty wizard wanting to attend an exhibition has to expect to give some of them a lift. A great many animals had already gathered at Marigold Meadows, excitedly waiting for the Art Society exhibition. On the grass stood dozens of easels, still covered in white linen to make the grand opening even more exciting. Dressed in an elegant black suit, Mr Ludwig Mole nervously checked his pocket watch. Only a few more minutes until he was supposed to hold the opening speech. It was only a few lines long, but he had practised it several times nonetheless. With a speech only a couple of lines long, it would be especially embarrassing to fluff or forget something. Ludwig looked around, somewhat disoriented. Nicholas? he asked, tapping the shoulder of a guest next to him. This was in fact Plato the Frog, who at least resembled Nicholas in terms of colour. To Ludwig, Plato, however, was an amorphous shade, while Nicholas was more of a blurred, slender line. Yes, said Plato. The frog was just talking to Jonas the Otter about a song he'd heard recently. Oh, you're not Nicholas, no, Ludwig concluded in confusion. He's right over there, Jonas said. Nicholas, he shouted, beckoning to his fellow musician. The lizard walked over. Jonas pointed to the mole and then continued his conversation with Plato. Showtime, I think, Nicholas asked his friend Ludwig. Ah, oh, there you are. Yes, we're about to start, Ludwig replied, calmly, now that his good friend was there. Break a leg, Nicholas said, slapping the mole on the back. Ludwig took a deep breath and started walking through the audience. On the way, he accidentally bumped into one of the wood dwarves, who was talking to Peter the Badger and his wife. Oi, watch it, said Logger, the wood dwarf. I'm sure it was an accident, said the badger lady, trying to calm him down. Accident? Pah! commented Steinberg. Ludwig was far too busy to notice what was going on around him. He eventually reached the podium and took off his glasses, polishing them with a handkerchief. Then he gave the audience time to quieten down and prepare for the speech. Soon the animals and a wood sprite fell silent in anticipation. Ludwig's wife was in the front row, quietly applauding to reassure her husband. Dear guests, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you tonight here at Marigold Meadows, Ludwig began, but was immediately interrupted by the muffled boom of approaching thunder. The guests turned in the direction the sound was coming from. In a cloud of dust and leaves, the wizard appeared from the forest, coming to an abrupt landing right in front of the astonished visitors. As the dust settled, he set down the beaver, Mr Brown, Rushlight and Edward the squirrel. At once Edward ran to his friends Oswald and Edgar, who had arrived half an hour before. The others joined the animals in the audience, and, as the excitement wore off, Ludwig continued. The Mousewood Art Society proudly and, for the first time, presents the work of an artist, a resident of Mousewood like all of us here. His paintings, completed over recent years, depict the forest from various points of view and, of course, the perspective of the artist himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare the exhibition open. The First Story Of Mice, Squirrels and Mousewood Forest That's all, folks. I like how they were connected. That was pretty nice. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, hey. Yeah, I stuck around. 
Uh, I never did run an ad, though. <laughs> Thank you about the drawing. Uh, I think... I figured you would. You asked for it. Well, that thus concludes the Night of the Rabbit.